So it looks like a couple directors need to be uh, promoted to panelists, and then we'll have a quorum and can get started. Yes, I see Vice President Lee sending over the promotion. And Director yes. Raper. Director Raper is here oh, as well. I see you now. And okay. April, when you're yes. ready, I'm ready to start. So are, are you ready? Um, I believe so. I think we just need to get the media camera on. President Saltzman, are you able to see us? No, but I think we should just start. Okay, sure. That's thing. okay. Yes, yeah, certainly. So, I will go ahead. I'm going to call the meeting to order and please call the roll. Sure thing. Director McPartland. Director Rayburn. Here. Director Simon. Director Allen. Here. Director Ames. Here. Director Dufty. Director Foley. Present. Vice President Lee. Here. President Saltzman. Here. Thank you. We have a quorum. Thank you. Uh, Director Ames, can you please lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance? We have a flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Um, so, pursuant to all necessary findings having been made by the Board of Directors of the San Francisco Bay Area Rapid Transit District for itself, as well as all subordinate legislative bodies to continue remote public meetings in the manner contemplated under urgency legislation, Assembly Bill number 361, public participation for this meeting will be via teleconference only. Um, and if you have joined us by calling in on Zoom uh, to make a public comment, please uh, dial star nine and then star six to unmute. And if you've joined us on a device on Zoom, please raise your hand uh, for a public comment. And um, based on the number of attendees uh, this evening, we may limit uh, the the time on public comment, but we'll, we'll see as we get to that part of the agenda. Um, are there any introductions of special guests? And if there are no introductions of special guests, um, we will move on to item 2A, uh, which is a resolution to continue virtual meetings during the pandemic. Uh, do we have a motion to approve? I move approval. I'll, I'll second, second it. it. This is Director Simon. I heard a motion by Director Rayburn, second by Director Simon. Um, any, I see a public comment, I believe, on this item, so we'll go to the public comment on this. Madam President. Joe, please go ahead. Thank you. Madam President, uh, board members, Joe Kunzler here. I'll be speaking to you about several items tonight, but just want to thank you for the remote meetings, and I want to ask that you, as I've asked other transits, uh, this is an ideological thing for me that you please ask your state legislators to permanently fix the Brown Act so you can have remote access after uh, the state of emergency uh, has passed. I want to thank this board staff for the greatest leadership and innovation you have shown during this uh, COVID-19 crisis. And I encourage the world famous board staff that everybody listens to on Transit Center to keep doing the work you're doing on these remote meetings. And I hope the California State Legislature will keep this permanent as able. Thank you for the time and thank you, Madam President and board members for your continued public service. See you later tonight. Thank you. Uh, seeing no further public comment on this item, is there any board discussion? 
then let's go to the vote. Director McPartland? Director Rayburn? Yay. Director Simon? Yes, thank you. Director Allen? Yes. Director Ames? Yes. Director Dufty? Director Foley? Aye. Vice President Lee? Yes. President Saltzman? Yes. Thank you, motion carries unanimously. Thank you. And in a moment, we'll go into closed session, but before we do, since I see there are members of the public and media here, um, for the open session items, we will not start those items until at least five. So um, we, you can come back then. You don't need to wait on here until then, though you're welcome to, but we will not start the rest of the open session until at least five, and we'll try to start as close to five as possible. Um, so we are now going to go into closed session under items 3A and 3B. Before we do that, are there any public comments on the closed session items? Seeing none, we will now go into closed session. And again, we will return um, by 5 p.m. Thank you.
So it's five o'clock, so we'll get started again. Um, we have just come back from closed session and there is nothing to report from closed session. So we will now move to item five, which is the report of the board president. I have a very brief report. Um, I, I just wanted to say, you know, I know when we had last had our business meeting, not, not the El Cerrito del Norte meeting, we had been thinking maybe by this meeting, we'd be ready to come back to in-person board meetings. Um, and we pulled the board and several people were not ready to do that yet. And that is why this is again, a fully virtual meeting. So we're going to continue to pay attention to COVID rates and we're going to continue to talk to the board and staff. Um, and we're not going to go back until people feel comfortable. So we'll, we'll continue to work on that and we'll announce as soon as we know when we're going back to in-person board meetings. Um, so that is my full report. So we will, if there are, are there any public comments on the, that item? If not, we will go on to the next item, which is item six, the consent calendar. Does anybody wish to remove an item? And if not, is there a motion to approve the consent calendar? I move to approve. Second. Uh, we have a motion and a second, although I saw Director Allen's hand go up. So would you wish to remove or comment on anything? No, I was just going to second. Okay. Um, you're, you're all very quick. Do we have any public comments on the consent calendar? I don't see any, so we will now go to the vote. Director McPartland. Aye. Director Rayburn. Yay. Director Simon. Yes. Director Allen. Yes. Director Ames. Yes. Director Dufty. Yes. Director Foley. Aye. Vice President Lee. Yes. President Saltzman. Yes. Thank you. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Uh, we will now go to item seven, which is the general manager's report. Thank you, President Selsman, members of the BART board. A couple of updates from you from the general manager here, starting with grants. Very positive news. I think Pam Herhold sent out a board memo, but BART was awarded about 49 million in TIRCP funds to support TOD related station access uh, investments or improvements at Lake Merritt, West Oakland, and El Cerrito Plaza stations. So, um, very positive news there. We also received 126 million in FTA. This is federal formula funds for our Fleet of the Future procurement. So, doing well there. Uh, st sticking on the transit oriented uh, development theme here. So on uh, Lake Merritt and Director Rayburn, thank you for being there for BART and um, in the Bay Area. At the Lake Merritt station, we received a very important milestone on our TOD project there. The first phase, which features 97 units of affordable housing for seniors on the BART parking lot at 8th and Oak, it received its final approval from the City of Oakland Planning Commission last Wednesday, which was the 20th. Director, thank you so much for your support and your leadership in speaking in support of that project. So on the same evening, um, well over 100 residents came to the El Cerrito Plaza BART station to learn about BART's plans for TOD at the station by attending an open house that we had out there. Um, and President Salzman, thank you for your leadership. Um, and what a great 100 residents out there. That's a great turnout and it was a great event. So. And again, thanks to Abby Thorne Lineman. She was in the middle of both of those discussions, I'm sure. Uh, the rooftop terrace at the BART headquarters. So when you're back to the in-person meetings here, or if you're, you're happy to come here for a meeting, the rooftop is open. Employees are loving it. We had a soft opening there. And um, it's a nice location to take a meeting, have a cup of coffee. Um, our internship program. It's a six week summer inter internship program and it's gonna be wrapping up here August 5th. We had nine students um, 
from the community-based partners, and we matched them throughout the district, and uh, just a very successful program, and it wraps up here in about a week or so. Uh, ridership, we continue the first three weeks in July. We were at weekday trips. We were averaging about 133,000 per day, um, so um, kind of steadied off there a little bit. Uh, but the month of June, we had a very strong month of June, which was um, really contributed to by some special events there. Uh, two other brief topics here. One of them I'll take. The second one I'm going to ask Shane, AGM of Operations, to take. So last Friday, this just a few days ago, staff handed out about 30,000 promotional tickets um, in our stations on the sea line, it was from Orinda to Antioch to, you know, in appreciation to our riders, we had some service disruptions out there. Staff was out there. Director Foley, thank you for being out there at Antioch and being part of the BART family out there, handing out there the tickets, talking to the riders. It was well received, and I think it was a, the right thing to do. And then I wanted Shane to walk the board very briefly through the extreme weather event um, that resulted in two cars of a 10-car train derailing out on the sea line. And we'll follow up with a memo. But this is the first um, business board meeting that we've had since that uh, extreme weather event. So, Shane. Thank you, GM. Good afternoon, directors. Um, on June 21st, on the sea line between Concord and Pleasant Hill on the C2 track, as we refer to it, we had a derailment. Uh, currently, BART is operating trains at a reduced speed in the area on both tracks. Uh, until the remain, we're working on replacing damaged concrete ties at this time, and we'll continue to surface as well as replace rail. Right now, single tracking is our biggest opportunities. We're doing that on Sundays that are scheduled uh, through our work calendar. And we're going to be planning a couple of upcoming shutdowns, which will allow us to replace the ties more efficiently and get greater quantities in the, in the, in the trackway. Additionally, procedures have been implemented, which will slow trains in four areas determined <clears throat> on the BART system, possibly susceptible to heat related impacts when the temperature is forecasted to reach 100 degrees or more. The slower travel would occur between the hours of 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. And just for your awareness, in the, in the last year, these areas have reached 100 degrees on only 10 days. Um, so we do not think that the delays to our patrons will be substantial, but if it's required due to the temperature, it will be safe. Uh, currently, between Concord and Pleasant Hill, we're running 27 miles per hour. That is due to track stability, which we have not attained yet, but we will shortly. And then I'll be putting out a detailed memo, as the GM described to you, uh, in a couple of weeks. But that will also have to coincide with the reports that we turn into the CPUC. So it will be right after that. Um, and we see that we, uh, the safety department will submit those reports within the next two to three weeks. And that's it for my report. So with that, President, I will entertain any questions that you or any of the board members might have on the general manager's report. Thank you. First, I'm going to go to public comment, and I see that we do have at least one public speaker. I'm going to limit public comment this evening to two minutes per speaker because I know I can already see we have a lot of people here and I'm sure we have more coming. So uh, let's go to public comment. Alita, please go ahead. Um, thank you, uh, President Rebecca Saltzman and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, my pronouns are she and her. Need a clock here, it would help. Thank you. You know, I love a good general, general manager's report, as always. Uh, and uh, lots of good things. Um, we're going to get some money for new rail cars because uh, I like riding new trains. I was on an older train today and it was very loud. I had to put my fingers in my ears. So uh, let's keep getting those new trains. Uh, should have got my decimal, decibel meter out. And uh, internship work uh, is very helpful. I wish I had that when I was young. 
When I was their age, I was skipping fare on the New York City subway. So we want to get people interested in BART in a good way, uh, that they could have a relationship with BART that will last uh, lifelong. So that, that, that's some very good work. And uh, as I think we need to have an explainer as to how this uh, promotional ticketing worked. I like promotional ticketing. I think it is great that we are helping people and, and giving them some fair relief uh, with those issues that happened out on the line. But we have to have a means to put those promotional tickets on Clipper. So if those were 30,000 paper tickets, we have to find out how many of those got damaged. Uh, because I've told you about damage metric card story. So we, we got to move away from paper tickets. I told you that I personally would not feel comfortable using one because it'd probably get damaged. So we, we got to work on that and improve that. Uh, so overall, uh, I think we have a good report here and being able to work more on solving these issues of um, the, uh, the heat and being able to keep our trains running. And it's for this reason that part is people system. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public comment on the general manager's report? And again, this isn't general public comment, but just on the general manager's report. And I see one more public comment. Gal Galaxy A325G, please go ahead. Can I speak? Yes, hi, is this Lily? Lily. Yes. Hi, my, my name is Milagritos Lopez and I'm a street vendor for eight years with my legal Petros license um, from the city of San Francisco on the bar, um, the bar on the, by the bar plaza in Mission Street at 24th Street Southwest Corner. I know Mr. I, uh, Mr. Gary Sue, okay, uh, for like a few years ago. He helped me to try to get a li um, permit for um, another street vendor. Um, she was approval, uh, but when the COVID comes start, um, we uh, we couldn't we couldn't finish the process. But now we have um, uh, I have a um, very worried uh, in, in this situation because I want to I know he's retired already and Miss Alicia now. He, she's the um, the new re re um, realtor to approve the permissions, and we involved with the organization Calle Twenty Four to help us to get a permission to sell our items. We are retail, and we are good people. It's like five or six street vendors to have an opportunity to ask you if it's possible to get a permission. Um, I hope. I hope they can help me. That's why we are outside. We came to, to in person to get a board meeting in person, but I know it's in Zoom. We, we, uh, we uh, before to set up our, uh, we are on the city selling, I sell jewelry in the 24 and Mission Southwest Corner. And we are very good people. We are honest. We are like uh, the oldest on, on, in our Southwest, it's clean. I have a lot of witness, the bar police, they know us for many years. I'm selling there for eight years and I need just the opportunity to be legal and to pay. We want to pay. Thank you so much for your comment. Um, I'm going to ask staff if we can follow up um, on this issue. And also just to remind the public right now, we're only taking public comment on the general manager's report and we will have general public later on in the meeting. So if you have a general comment or an item, uh, comment on another item on the agenda, please lower your hand now. So I, I do see one more hand. Um, I hope it's about the general manager's report or I'm gonna ask you to wait to, to speak until later. So next, next comment. Caller whose number ends in 2997, please go ahead. Thank you, this is Joe Kunzler. Um, I have a question question for the general manager, if that's okay. And that is, uh, Mr. General Manager, do you share my belief that when uh, board employees go to transit conferences, that 
transit fans and intertransit agencies rearranged their schedules to attend and listen to the input and leadership that BART has shown, not just the Bay Area, but the greatest nation on God's green earth, the United States of America, and how to, how to provide world-class transit. And that is literally my question. I know we have a very intense item coming up, and I know we're all really excited about it, so I will hang, I will come back later. Thank you. Thank you. I will now go to directors. I don't see any further public comment. Um, so, Director Allen. Thank you, Bob. Um, and thank you, Shane, both of you for, for um, reporting out on the, uh, the derailment incident in Concord. Um, there was a news report by NBC Bay Area that appeared today actually regarding uh, the derailment and suggested that our train was traveling 70 miles per hour through the turn when that derailment happened. And I, I'm very happy to hear you talk about um, putting a protocol in place for slowing the trains during heat related uh, events, particularly out in Contra Costa where it gets very hot. Um, but my question is, um, did we have such a protocol um, when this event took place in Concord, when the derailment occurred? Uh, Director, at the time of this derailment, we did not have any written protocols in place. Okay, so are we going to put our protocols in writing and make sure everyone understands them now? We do have a district-wide and OCC uh, inter interim operating procedure that spells out the criteria based on forecast of heat, not heat itself. So we will put the restrictions out on the track prior to reaching 100 degrees, but at a forecasted 100 degrees or greater. And then uh, if you're familiar with our rainy season, we have something that we call the rain file when we run trains. We have done the same thing now for heat. So as of last night, that download was in, put into the system and was successfully downloaded. So now the OCC doesn't need necessarily a track personnel to call them and say, I need slow orders at four different locations and give them the milepost. The system will already identify that as a heat location. They hit the, they hit the program button and those trains will get the signal to run at restricted speed through those areas whatever that speed restriction is defined as, which in all four of these cases I'm referring to is 27 miles per hour right now. Thank you for explaining that. I'm, I'm, I'm happy to hear that we're addressing this. Um, I think the article you know, that appeared suggested that maybe this had been a protocol in the past um, because there were a news article, at least one about it, um, but anyway, um, the, I'm glad that we're addressing it now. The, uh, the other question that I have for you is, um, you mentioned something about a report to the CPUC. Was this incident um, investigated by, does it come under the jurisdiction of NTSB or is it CPUC that, that would investigate and issue an independent report or does anybody issue an independent report on this incident? The CPUC will be uh, what we would refer to as a governing body, so to speak, that we will produce a report to. Uh, if they share that with NTSB, I do not know. But of the night of the derailment, the CPUC was on site. They've taken pictures. They've taken measurements. They walked the entire alignment of the derailment site. Um, they have not yet received a lot of the information that we have gathered, though, so that's what I meant by sharing the report as well as other information including videos and that's things of that nature once we've shared that with cpuc then i will definitely give you a, re a robust uh, briefing on on the entire incident okay i appreciate you uh, you also mentioned you'd be following up with us with information to the board and i really do appreciate being kept up to date um you know our, our bart writers need to believe in us that we're doing our jobs to keep them safe we have uh We've been very conscious of being transparent with our patrons and the media. Uh, everything that we've put out so far is completely true. Um, but when you have events of this nature, it's usually not just one 
root cause. There could be multiple things that led to, to this to happen. Uh, we do know that the defining moment was the heat. Um, but there's a whole thing about train dynamics and all of that sort of thing that, that will be part of the reporting system. And then we'll, we will definitely discuss those items. Excellent. Thank you, Shane. Director McPartland. Thank you. Um, back to Shane. Um, not that I want to end up on, on uh, hammering on the same subject, but uh, I would like to cover it a little bit uh, uh, further. Uh, I can understand why we didn't have any policy in place because between my employee time and my director time, I've been here for 20 years and it's the first time this, this thing has happened. And it may very well be the first time in the, in the history of BART. Uh, in looking back, though, over real incidents that uh, uh, in my previous career that I, I ended up studying, uh, whether it be earthquake or something else, you can, uh, if there's flexation, I was wondering whether uh, the train operator ended up reporting seeing the rail uh, snaking because of the, uh, uh, because of the heat. Uh, Shane, do you, do you have any information about that? Um, nothing has been released yet, but I can tell you, Director, with confidence that this event happened underneath the train as it was moving over it, and that thermal misalignment formed directly underneath the eighth or ninth car. Um, that is a proven fact as of right now. Um, that confirmed all of my suspicions through my experience, and uh, it tends to, it it turns out to be true. So to answer your question, train operator did not have an opportunity to see it or hit the emergency button and slow down or stop prior to it because it happened underneath the train. Understood. Uh, that's uh, you missed the question. The uh, if the the heat we have expansion joints on bridges for a reason. And so that we don't end up having buckling. And because of the tolerances that we need with our rail, um, uh, I don't know whether we can even do that. Uh, and I would think that we, we couldn't. But uh, if the rail visibly is snaking uh, in front of the train operator, I was wondering, I've, I've only seen disasters after the fact on uh, uh, records of it. And uh, I'm curious as to whether uh, that kind of uh, visual phenomenon would be available to the train operator and put that into consideration whether the train operator would have uh, the authority. Uh, okay, I'm going to cancel this entire conversation. This is getting way too deep in the weeds, and uh, I'll end up talking to you uh, offline about this, that, if that's okay with you. Yes, sir. That's a that great idea. Okay. <laughs> Thank and, you. And uh, I, I would like to end up uh, giving a compliment. Uh, I ended up checking into uh, how fast and expeditiously the uh, injured patients were uh, evacuated and taken to hospitals. Job well done. Thank you very much. Director Simon? Yeah, I want to be really quick. Um, and I actually want to bring up something that has to do with the general manager that you didn't report today, and it may actually be inappropriate, but I'm going to do it anyways. Um, we have our, our chief is, I believe, sitting next to our general manager. Is that right? Yes. So I learned, um, and I'm so excited about this, that the amazing and wonderful uh, Deputy Chief Alvaret um, is going to become a police chief next week. Is that right? Did I read the right article? Uh, Director Ch Simon, yes, that is correct. That is such a big deal. It's a huge loss for BART. You know, Deputy Chief Alvarez really helped this institution, along with your leadership, create a new vision um, that rejected the, the false promise that you either needed to be, you know, really tough on people or you needed to sort of be soft. You all created a unit together um, that, you know, police departments, and I know this from my work, um, are, are, are deeply not only appreciative of, but trying desperately to emulate some of the programs, both from the ambassadors to um, our social workers, to the, the amazing training that we're doing with our officers going above and beyond the human resources outreach that you and uh, Deputy Chief Alvarez have, has led. It's amazing to see that our folks are so good um, that folks are gonna keep 
taken them away. And so it's a good and a bad, but I think I can speak on behalf of the rest of the board that on August 1st, when she takes this position, um, we are going to all of us, not just your department, but folks around uh, the BART community, we're gonna be um, sending her our love and, and deep congratulations. Becoming a police chief is, as you know, no easy feat. And so I think I can speak on behalf of the board. Congratulations, Deputy Chief. You will be so missed and you're so brilliant and so thoughtful and so kind and you love our people, you love our community, you love Barrier Rapid Transit. And um, yeah, I'm kind of jealous of Los Altos, but it's all good. That's it. Thank you, Director Simon, for, for bringing that up. I think we're, we're all sad for our loss, but, but really excited for her and, and what she'll do there. Um, just wanted to thank um, the general manager and Shane for the report on the derailment and the questions that, that followed from directors. Um, I, I, I think this should be an ongoing conversation, not just with the memo we get, you know, it's good that we're like in the one place in the country that hasn't been in a hundred degree weather consistently for the past few weeks, but we know with climate change, there's going to be more of that coming. So I hope in the coming year or so, you can bring back some more information about what the long-term solutions are for these heat related problems on our tracks, because I think we have to assume over time, there are going to be more and more of those days over 100 degrees, even if we don't have as many of them as other parts of the country. Um, so just would ask you to kind of keep thinking of that and, and bring it back to the board. And just to end on a happier note, um, thanks, Bob, for bringing up the El Cerrito Plaza outreach. It was really fantastic. We haven't had in-person outreach for that TOD project since fall of 2019. We've been doing it all over Zoom, and it's just over Zoom, you get your two-minute comments and can't do any back and forth. So it was really nice to see the staff and consultants, and I got to have lots of conversations with constituents, and I think people really appreciated the, the opportunity for longer conversations. So those in-station outreach events are fantastic. I hope we will do more and more of them, um, especially at the stations that have the outdoor space to do them. So I don't see any other director comments. So we will move on to the next agenda item, which is um, item 8A uh, under board matters. It's the resolution to reinstitute the inclusion of a mask requirement in the customer code of conduct. And I will uh, turn it over to Director Dufty if he wants to say a few words about this before we go to public comment and then come back to the board for discussion. Yes, uh, thank you, Madam President. Uh, I do appreciate being recognized. And um, I think that, you know, unfortunately, the past measure uh, did expire. I think that COVID is at its most transmissible right now. And I think that our responsibility is to stay the course and to ensure that our riders many of whom are immunocompromised, um, are, are safe and feel welcome in our system. Um, I do want to say that the president um, spoke with me about some possible amendments. And so I would like to speak to that briefly if that is appropriate. And um, so uh, I would like to propose, a, 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 obviously, a friendly amendment since it's my measure this before us to extend um, to September 22nd meeting of our board instead of the September 8th meeting so that we have time. And the purpose is, as uh, President Saltzman has spoken about is so that we have the opportunity to consider on a longer basis um, how we will handle mask mandates and whether or not we associate criteria whether about the path of the disease or actions by county health officers. And um, it would give us enough time for our staff to, to reach out. So um, I don't know, President Saltzman, if you would second that for me, but I'm offering that as a friendly amendment. I will, but just to clarify, because I'm not sure it was totally clear that it would still extend to October 1st as it is written, 
but instead of reconsidering on September 8th, we'd wait till September 22nd. So it doesn't change the length of the mask requirement. It just gives us a little bit more time because this thing's just changing constantly to, to see what's happening. So, and yes, yes that, that is how I read it and interpreted it. And I just want to say, I think that we've seen an enormous increase in number of, of COVID cases with this very transmissible variant. And while um, uh, it is fortunate that many individuals come out unscathed in a relatively short period of time, uh, I still know people who've now entered the world of long COVID um, in, in these most recent infections. And I do think it's a responsibility. I appreciate that, uh, you know, we're not going to get to 100%, but I do think that we are part of a culture and we have been in a leadership position in terms of our um, strenuous desire to make our patrons feel safe. And I think this is an important juncture, particularly with September providing half off fares. We want people to feel safe writing. So um, uh, I appreciate President Saltzman's support of that amendment. And, um, you know, we can consider that after public comment if that's appropriate. Thank you so much. Thank you. So I would like to go to public comment. Director Simon, I see your hand up. If you have something really brief or a clarifying question, go ahead. But I'd like to save most of the board discussion until after. I do. It's, it's literally t uh, 10 seconds. I may not be here to be a part of this vote. Um, and I, I want to express my deep um, my deep love for Bevan for, for putting it forward. And I am completely in agreement that we do need to be um, supportive of, of mask on BART for as long as, the, as long as we need to. Um, and if I didn't get a chance for, for comments, I just wanted to put them up front. Thanks. And I love you too. Thank you. Um, so we will now go to public comment. Again, we're going to limit uh, comments to two minutes. So we'll go to the first speaker. And this is just for comments on the mask requirement. Caller whose number ends in 2997, please go ahead. I want to thank the Bart Joe Consort here. Um, this is the moment we've all waited for, the championship moment. The uh, it, it, This is like the Oakland Raiders, the uh, Oakland Raiders playing for the Super Bowl, I guess. And uh, it's a great privilege and honor to be the first speaker on this. I'm a huge supporter of public transit. I am thankfully not immunocompromised, but I seem to catch every single cold and flu. My mother recently got COVID-19 and thankfully beat the body virus, but a previous infection does not mean continual immunity. Masking is so vital and important to help defeat this virus. We will get new vaccines, hopefully in the fall or the winter, that will help put this virus on the back foot, but we have to protect the vaccine. That means not using it as our only tool against this bloody COVID-19 that has devastated transit ridership nationwide. And for the part of Director Powers and Elisa Trost and the board board, you need to be the national leaders right now. You need to be that beacon of hope for everybody trying to get their transit agencies to join you in a mask requirement. I know it's hard and to some extent it's unfair that BART has to shoulder this responsibility of national leadership. But when the MTA just let go of the second best customer service officer at Sarah Meyer, uh, when the LA area you know, needs a prompt, when Sound Transit needs a firm kick in the butt, you, will, you are there. And I ask that BART please be a national leader and take the fight to COVID instead of from it, because we need to get ridership back and we need all transit fans of all ages to be healthy and safe. And I want to thank your, your, your agency for your wonderful leadership all, all these years. Thank you and go, let's go BART. Thank you, next speaker. Caitlin, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm Caitlin Sundling, a physician scientist, assistant professor and member of the World Health Network and the COVID Action Group. I've been asked by members of the community to come and support the need for broad masking requirements in the Bay Area, especially within the BART system, as public transportation is so essential for everyone. I would also like to strongly support public health mes messaging on the risks and harms of long COVID, and I really appreciate Director Dufty's emphasis on this. Cases are high in San Francisco with a current seven-day average positivity rate of 13.4%. BA5, the growing variant, has higher transmissibility and severity 
than previous variants. Vaccine efficacy is, has decreased significantly, so a vaccine-only approach can't protect the public. Mask requirements are needed to make it safer for high-risk individuals, including immunocompromised people, people with disabilities, and seniors, and all people, to access public spaces and essential services. Universal masking lowers the risk of infection is, and is significantly more effective than one-way masking. There is significant growing information about long COVID. It's critical for everyone to know that long COVID is present in at least a third of infected individuals and involves long-term serious damage to brain function, vascular function, the immune system, and multiple other organs. Everyone is vulnerable to long COVID effects, including healthy young adults and children. Monkeypox is also a growing concern in the Bay Area and anyone can be infected. Transmission through physical contact and contact with bedding and clothing and other surfaces is considered dominant, but there is strong evidence for airborne transmission of monkeypox. Masks will also help mitigate the spread of monkeypox, as well as COVID. I strongly support mask requirements. More information is available on the World Health Network website at worldhealthnetwork.global. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 5615, please go ahead. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Hi, my name is Sarah, and I'm with Senior and Disability Action. I'm high risk, and I live in a high risk household. This issue is deeply personal to me. First of all, I want to thank you for showing true leadership by reinstating the mask mandate on BART the last time it came up for a vote. You have an opportunity, again, to lead by example, protect the most vulnerable, everyone really, and continue to show moral clarity that public health is what matters most, that normalizing mass infections, mass death, and mass disability is absolutely unacceptable. According to a July 15th Mercury News article, the Bay Area is currently experiencing the biggest surge in cases since the original Omicron peak in January. Case counts are the highest they've been since early February, and experts are warning that the latest variant, BA5, is the most infectious and transmissible yet. It is more crucial than ever to re-implement mitigation measures like a mask mandate, especially on public transportation where people are crowded together in an enclosed space. It just makes sense. Masks are first and foremost a protection, not a restriction. I think language really matters when we talk about this. And so much scientific evidence shows that two-way masking is much more effective than one-way masking. As someone who is chronically ill and disabled, I don't feel safe moving around in the world where I'm wearing a mask and others are not. And I'm talking about basic necessary things like going to the pharmacy to pick up my meds. I've also delayed in-person care several times during the pandemic. Currently, it's been almost a year now since I've seen a doctor in person because the seemingly endless roller coaster we've all been put through and this overall message is that everyone will get it eventually. It's not a big deal. Why bother with basic public health? It's alarming and disturbing. The possibility of contracting COVID literally keeps me up at night because it could be very much devastating for me. And I say this as someone with access to a car. Now imagine folks who rely on public transit Thank and how you. much more Can, vulnerable they must you, feel. Your two no minutes one does, have I, left, no so one if you could wrap feel up. Like they're playing a game of roulette with their very lives and or health and well-being. That's why reinstating the mask made it, mandate on Sarah, is of the utmost Sarah. importance. Please understand the gravity of this situation for so many of us. Please do. And. Thank you, April. I'm sorry. You know, if you go a little over two minutes, I'll ask you to wrap up. So please do wrap up. We, we hear what you said, but we do want to respect the time of everybody else who's called in to speak. So we'll go to the next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 9882, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Hi, my name is Raya Small. I'm an organizer with Senior and Disability Action, and I'm so glad that you all are voting on reinstating the mask requirement on BART, and we really appreciate that you have listened to us and met with us and, like, actually taken our considerations to heart, which so many other um, agencies right now have not been doing. Um, you know, and today I was speaking to someone about the mask requirement on BART, 
And he asked, um, you know, why should BART have a mask requirement when bars and restaurants and gyms and airports don't? And I think the answer to that is very simple, and it's that public transportation is essential. Like many of us have been choosing to avoid bars and restaurants and not fly on planes and not go to the gym for two and a half years now, but so many people cannot choose to avoid BART. Um, we take it to work, we take it to school, we take it to run errands, to medical appointments, to meet up with friends, all sorts of things. And it's just such an essential service. Also thinking about how this week is the 32nd anniversary of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it's the end of Disability Pride Month, and how it's just so essential for disability rights for BART to remain accessible to people who are high risk for COVID. And it's the same reason that we have elevators and ramps and seating for seniors and people with disabilities and that we have signage that you know comes through auditory and visual methods all of those things make BART accessible for people with disabilities and masks are just another access need like that so i'm really urging you to please vote in favor of reinstating the mask requirement i really appreciate your leadership on this and we're going to keep pushing sfmta and ac transit and others to follow suit thank you thank you next speaker Caller whose number ends in 3920, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Jen and I'm a member of Senior and Disability Action. I'm calling to the BART Board of Directors to reinstate the mask mandate on BART. You know, I've been thinking a lot about both groupthink and courage over the past two plus years of the pandemic and how there's been so much groupthink and so little courage from so many of our leaders. When the BART Board voted to establish their own mask mandate in April, you all showed a tremendous amount of courage. You've been a beacon of hope amidst so many government officials at all levels just choosing to normalize mass infection, mass suffering, mass disability, and mass death. Make no mistake, your guys' mass mandate has saved lives. And now you have the choice again to choose courage, to choose moral conviction, to choose public health, to choose science. Your decision could be the difference between someone gasping their last breath or living a long, fulfilling life. It could be the difference between someone becoming bedbound, saddled with thousands upon thousands of dollars of medical debt, and being able to chase after their dreams and live to their fullest potential. I hope you don't take this decision lightly. So many people's lives are in your hands. Right now, all nine Bay Area counties have been classified by the CDC as having high community levels, which means that not only is transmission high, but also that hospital capacity is starting to become strained. Masking works best when it's universal, when there's less virus in the air to begin with, especially with more transmissible, transmissible and or immune evasive virus variants like BA5. Mask requirements help keep BART accessible for the most vulnerable among us, and I'm thinking about this within the context of the ADA's 32nd anniversary a couple days ago. And it also helps protect everybody as everyone is potentially at risk for long COVID, and there's still a lot to learn about the potential long-term health risks of repeat in infection. In the face of so much government abandonment, please continue to be a beacon of hope. Please do the right thing. Reinstate the mask mandate. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 9714, please go ahead. Please accept the unmute request. There you go. Hi, uh, one moment. Hi, uh, one moment. If you have more than one device, please go ahead and mute one of them. Hi, okay. Thank you for your patience. My name is Casey, and I work at the Center for Independent Living. Our organization is also working with Senior Disability Action. I work with people with disabilities and older adults on residential access, assistive technology, and transportation. Every time I've been alerted to Getting a COVID exposure, it means that I can't work with my consumers. I also myself live with energy limiting chronic illness. If I were to get COVID, I would be at high risk for complications and it would be very likely that I would not be able to work. I have used BART for my job. I have uh, taught and worked with people with disabilities who are using public transportation and BART um, in travel training. We work with people to help them learn how to use BART. Furthermore, the Center for Independent Living is on top of a BART station, which means a greater exposure to people who use BART to get to our office for services or to get to work. 
I want those who can't choose to not use public transportation for financial reasons or other reasons to be able to do so in the safest way possible, and that's with masks. Please keep masks on public transportation, and please help us reduce community exposure. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 4191, please go ahead. Please accept the unmute request. Hi, my name is Alice and I'm an active member of Senior and Disability Action. And I urge you to please vote today uh, to bring back BART's masking requirement for everyone's safety and access, including my own. I really appreciate your meeting with us and your previously um, uh, reinstating a mask mandate. Uh, during that time, I was able to use public transit again. I cannot use it when masks aren't required. I live with a beloved person who has a weak immune system, a wonderful family member, and I myself don't want to risk getting long COVID. And as other people have testified, uh, we're all at risk of long COVID. And that's even if we're fully boosted, uh, even if we're fully vaccinated and boosted, especially if our boosters like mine is waning. Um, so, um, I, for example, have no idea how I'm going to get to my COVID safe dentist in San Francisco. I live in Berkeley. I need dental work and I have no clue how I can get there safely if masks are required. And I'm actually a really lucky person. I can work from home. Many people, including people at high risk of severe illness from COVID, must take the BART to get uh, to work. Uh, they must take the BART to get to their medical appointments. Um, and certainly everyone should be able to take the part to get to their friends' houses or wherever they want and need to go. And so many people um, with cannot have a don't have can't have a car for disability related reasons, uh, uh because of um uh they can't afford a car or or both or other reasons. Um so yeah um I uh, wanted to emphasize that even though it seems like you have good ventilation in your trains, if you are near somebody who is unmasked, you are still at risk. There's been much documentation, including um, in, uh, of outdoor uh, COVID transmission, including uh, Fortune magazine and um, uh, the Chronicle have reported on on that as well. And um, thank, thank you so much. Article I put in my your yeah. two minutes have passed, so go ahead and wrap up, though. Sure, thank you. Uh, you'll, if you just look at my public testimony, uh, that written public testimony, I cited the Slate article from February, which was titled, I believe, uh, Why One-Way Masking Isn't a Very Good Public Health uh, Solution, which shows how um, N95s, at the very least if they're not fit tested, still don't protect you when you're up near others, at least inside, unmasked. And the, these highly transmissible subvariants have just got more transmissible since then. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you so much. Next speaker. Alita, please go ahead. Um, thank you again, uh, President Rebecca Saltzman and members. Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her. So I'm in support. Supported this before. I'll support it again. Um, thank you. I'm going to take a bit of a different tack here. I am simply an ordinary user of BART and other systems of public transportation, uh, including 52 years on the New York City subway. And so uh, being 56 and a disabled veteran with a reduced fare clipper card, I need all the tools in my toolbox to stay safe. I climbed a hill in Potrero Hill today. I did fine, uh, and but the thing is, if I get COVID, I might not be able to climb hills. I have never had COVID. I hope never to. And so I was thinking about air filtration, and I used to work in industrial settings with filtration. So See, I can wear a mask, but if I'm the only person in a space wearing a mask, my mask has to do a lot more work to filter the air than if more people in the space were wearing masks. It's kind of like uh, if you let your air conditioner filter get too dirty. So I think it's very important that people in many kinds of spaces wear masks. And I've flown 
26 times in the last year. Uh, the last few flights, I didn't have to wear a mask, but I did. And I have continued to wear masks on BART and other systems of public transportation. See, I'm a person who is different and does not meet societally established definitions. And so I am the most at risk. I ask that you pass this measure because this will signify what I've been saying all along, that BART is indeed the people system. Pass it. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 7575, please go ahead. Thank you. Um, my name is Michael Lyon. I'm with Gray Panthers as well as, well as uh, SDA. And I have a uh, personal acquaintance with the fantastic infectivity of the, uh, of the latest strains. My son is a uh, camp nurse in the Trinity Alps. And uh, this is a uh, camp that has no indoor settings at all. It's all outdoor. Um, and the, um, the campers uh, hike a lot. They're in single file. They're at least six feet apart. And yet there was a huge wave of, uh, of COVID through, uh, through their camp. So uh, it's true. It's the infectivity is approaching that of, uh, of measles. And we all need to do everything we can to, uh, uh, to prevent the spread and to reduce the amount of uh, COVID virus that's in the air. Um, uh, my situation is my wife has um, idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, and uh, for her to get COVID would be a uh, it, would, it would it would be all over. Um, and um, I'm 82. I certainly don't want to uh, get long COVID myself. So um, you need to pass this uh, mask mandate, and. Um, so other transit agencies will be looking at you and uh, it'll have a spreading effect. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Nayeli, please go ahead. Hello, my name is Nayeli and I'm a supporter of Senior and Disability Action. I live in San Francisco and I'm calling because I'm very concerned that BART's mask requirement has expired. COVID levels are rising across the Bay Area and are all at, we're all at risk of long COVID, even if we're vaccinated and boosted. Many disabled people, seniors, people of color, low-income people, and essential workers rely on BART and we need it to be safe. I personally support the mask mandate for three reasons. First, my family and I rely on transit as we don't drive and we have friends, family and community on both sides of the Bay Bridge. With no mask requirement on transit and only one way masking, me and my little kids are risking exposure every day. Second, I work as a legal aid attorney for people with disabilities, helping people with disabilities secure income, housing and healthcare services. The communities that I serve will be harmed without a mask requirement on public transit. Finally, I support a mask requirement because I see that we are in a climate crisis. And the more we can encourage people to take public transit instead of driving, the more we can make people feel like transit is safe, the better we'll be doing in the long run for our planet. So please listen to, to disabled people and seniors and reinstate the mask requirement on BART. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Jordan, please go ahead. Good afternoon. My pronouns are she and her, and I'm a high-risk individual. I may even have long COVID, but I'm sick and tired of mandates, and most of the rest of the country is too. There may have been a time when mandates were necessary, but those days have passed. Everybody has the ability to get vaxxed and boosted free of charge. And if you are senior or disabled, there are other options, like a second booster, and you can always opt to wear an N95 because it protects you no matter what. I can attest to this. And if you refuse to get vaxxed, then you're getting what's coming to you. The people advocating for permanent mask mandates just don't care about the working class who are vaxxed, relaxed, and sick of having to be a mask police for the past two years. Case in point, 
Didn't you see those flight attendants celebrating when the federal mandate was lifted? And did you see all those passengers celebrating? And really, let's just say the only people who've been ventilated or dying from COVID in the past six months, they've been Trump QAnon types who refuse to get vaccinated. We live in a culture that, like it or not, believes in personal responsibility. And in the post-vaccination world, this shouldn't even be on the agenda. Stop focusing on divisive issues that are political liability in most of the country and start focusing on the nuts and bolts of the system. And just, I mean, I'm a disability rights advocate. I usually agree with senior and disability action, those people on that. But this is just not something to, uh, this is not a hill to die on because let's face it, like, uh, and I hate invoking ADA and 504 because as someone who uh, benefits from this, like, that never was intended to make other people like your peers do it. It was made to make people uh, with a higher power dynamic perform in a certain way. And I believe in my body, my choice for abortion and gender transition. And I believe that should apply in the post-vaccine world for masks. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 9601. Please go ahead. Hello. Hello, my name is Beth Kenny, and I am a um, disability rights advocate from Alameda, California, where I serve as a commissioner on the Disability Commission here, and I'm also part of Senior Disability Action. Um, as our last caller showed so um, aptly, there's a lot of misinformation out there, and I applaud you guys for following the science and following the what's actually happening in when you um, placed a mask requirement back in April. It was to protect not only people with disabilities, but all riders and BART employees. Um, and when you let that uh, expire, you're letting us all get um, transmissions of COVID that could have been prevented if people were wearing masks. Uh, I think a lot of the prior callers have explained quite well the need for masking. Um, and I just would encourage you as a board to really look at the effects that masking has had on your agency. Um, what uh, are you, we're hearing a lot about staffing shortages what, what kind of staffing shortages were you having during the mask versus compared to other agencies? What sort of um, employee retention are you able to have compared to others? Because in 2021, the Bureau of Labor Statistics found that 1.2 million additional people um, had were people with disabilities um, just in the year 2021. The non-disabled population stayed stagnant during that time. So when you hear about working shortages, you have to understand that, that part of that has to be affected by people who are no longer able to work from long COVID. And I encourage you to really actually start looking at the effects that COVID has had on your organization. So um, thank, the, thank you for your uh, comments. Your two minutes are up, so if you could wrap up. Wrap up. I'll just leave it there. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Elizabeth, please go ahead. Yes. Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I'm um, a member of Senior and Disability Action. And I just wanted to, to um, just to thank Bart for being a leader in the past when it comes to reinstating the mask mandate. Um, you know, that it is definitely a move that saves the lives of many people. Um, and to echo what's been said, um, public transit is an essential service. Um, you know, I'm, I'm immunocompromised, I don't have a car, um, and I, I need to rely on public transit and um, mask mandates on BART make it safer for everyone. I'd also like to add that even if a mask mandate is not followed perfectly by everyone on BART, um, this, um, studies have shown that having mask mandates in place still make a difference. Um, 
people will see that a mask mandate is required, like that, that a mask mandate is in place and will know, will take that as a sign that yes, you know, that's because no, like um, we're experiencing more COVID right now. And, um, you know, like, so I think, I think that's important to recognize too, that people um, just, just how important they are, even if you don't have a hundred percent perfect compliance, um, it's, it still is leading the way and messaging that's really important. And um, you will absolutely be saving lives by reinstating the mask mandate. Um, and I urge you to do so. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Warren, please go ahead. Call the audio now unmuted. Hello, oh, you've been quite. Hello, uh, members of the Bard Board. Um, my name is Warren Cushman, and I am a member of Senior Disability Action. I am totally blind. I would like to thank the Bard Board for supporting the mask mandate in the past. Uh, I am immunocompromised. My primary partner is immunocompromised. I have two. Uh, I have two people in my circle who have long COVID. So this is this is really important stuff. I mean, long COVID is, as I heard earlier, affects as much as a third of people who get COVID. So so we really can't we can't ignore that that reality. And so you know, I I, I do want to urge the Bart Board to continue what it's done in the past. Please pass the mandatory requirement for masks. Uh, we do are we are setting an example to other transit agencies who hope follow suit. And one final point. Um, as BART and AC Transit together share the responsibility of East Bay Paratransit as a rider of East Bay Paratransit, um, I do think that East Bay Paratransit should also be required to have masks and hope and and this and that may be a policy that follows from the policy that are, that it happens today. Thank you, and and hopefully we'll move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 9559, please go ahead. Hi, my name is Alyssa Matros. I am a member of Senior and Disability Action. Thank you so much for your bold leadership in instituting a mask mandate. You are a beacon of hope for us transit riders. To merely recommend but not mandate masking simply does not work. We have only to look at how air travel has changed since mask mandates were dropped. News coverage of crowded airports across the United States show masses of unmasked people in close proximity to one another. Faced with recommendations, people feel freer to go without masks. With mask mandates, most people do the right thing. I urge the BART board to do the right thing today reinstate the mask mandate and thank you so much thank you next speaker mark please go ahead thank you my name is mark chuckle uh, i live in rebecca saltzman's district i'm coming today representing myself as an individual not my employer or not an organization i did send you all a letter i don't I don't see it on your website, so I don't know if you all got it. Um, I live in Berkeley. I'm an essential worker in San Francisco. I take BART and, and or AC Transit and Muni to and from work uh, five days a week. Um, and um, I'm also immune compromised. I'm on a rheumatoid arthritis medication, an injection that reduces uh, my ability to fight infection. Um, I, uh, trusting a caller earlier, I have been vaxed and vaccinated five times. Um, June 2nd being the last one. Unfortunately, I got COVID uh, when I was masked, presumably on a player airplane with an N95. Um, and, um, and I was pretty sick. And then I took Paxlovid. I got COVID rebound. So I was in quarantine for a total of 16 days. It's very serious to me. I need to go to work. I've been driving since I've been back in the office. Um, luckily, because I have parking spot right now, but I won't in another couple of weeks. Um, Public health has failed us. I have a master's in public health. I used to be the chair of the Berkeley Health Commission. I'm very disappointed by our health officers for failing to uh, do what they know is the right thing. And I beg you all to do the right thing. I thank Director Dufty for bringing this. And I wanna urge you all to schedule, if you do pass it today, 
a meeting in plenty of time so the mask mandate uh, requirement does not expire again. The mandate works. I saw the difference when you reinstituted it on BART. And, um, and I know a lot of us feel that way. And I just beg you, please, it's my health and my life. And it really does matter. So thank you for letting me be a productive member of society and keeping me safe. Thank you. And I do want to clarify that the resolution does include language to bring it back to the board um, in advance of the expiration date so it can be considered. So that is part of what we're voting on today. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 6233, please go ahead. Hi, good evening. My name is Antonio Taylor. I'm a long-time complainer, um, three-time caller. I'm disappointed in this board because you are acting like it's still March 2020. You are legislating based upon fear and not facts. You have stayed in the state of fear of prolonging the magic of COVID that you and your fellow Democrats and President Biden have now induced a recession and potentially a depression. The board has played politics and honestly not even asked the right questions out of the bar service area. How many people in all of the major county hospitals were hospitalized with COVID and had severe symptoms? Is the COVID variant right now, you say is transmissible, is the most deadliest, like the OG of it? The science has shown that mass mandates have not worked. Alameda County had a mass mandate last month, whereas the other counties in the Bay Area did not. If it worked, then the rates would have dropped like a rock, but it didn't. Neighboring country across the county had no mandates, yet its rates were lower and parallel to Alameda County. The board has already made up their mind as you're going to move the goalposts again. Not one of you are licensed physicians or have medical degrees. I will not be following your charade of an edict as the state legislature has not delegated health powers to special use districts such as BART. BART cannot even stop fair or stop um, people from using illicit drugs in the metro system. The board wants to bypass five different county councils and health authorities, which Ms. Saltzman, you have no right to do. With that being said, Chief Alvarez, you personally and your 200-man staff are going to have to put me in handcuffs and drag me off the trains and throw me in a dungeon every time you see me. You are not a godfather, and I will refuse your offer for a mask. Rosa Parks said no 70 years ago because she was tired of the crap that she dealt with then, and I'm telling you no because I'm tired of being polite to you progressives and dealing with this emotional blackmail. I'm willing to pay the price to simply stand up for myself because courage is simply lacking in the Bay Area. Extremism is no, is no defense, is defense. The extremism is the defense of liberty, is no vice. I simply oppose and I will not follow your orders. I hereby yield my time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Harlow, please go ahead. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Harlow. I live in and work in San Francisco. I'm a regular BART writer and I'm in support of extending the mask mandate. Um, this is definitely the right thing to do. Not only protects our most vulnerable writers, but everyone who uses transit. Um, I'm a young, low-risk individual with just contracted COVID. And, you know, I don't know if I'll get long COVID and be affected with worse health outcomes down the line. Um, and as someone who relies on public transit almost every day, uh, I, I feel it's important to feel safe and be safe on transit. The mandate would help reduce transmission, save lives, and just give peace of mind to all transit riders. So uh, please urge you to reinstate the mask requirement and make sure that we have a safe, healthy transit system for everyone. Uh, thank you. <laughs> Director Lee, I'm going to ask you to take over facilitating for just a moment. I will be back in a second. Um, all good. I think we still have public commenters. Yes, we can move to the next speaker. Call who num whose number ends in 91833. Please go ahead. Is that me? Yes, that's Sue, and we can hear you. Hello? Yes, okay, please thank go you. ahead. I wasn't sure when my turn was coming. Thank you. Um, I have listened to everybody's concerns, but I have a couple other unique questions to ask. Number one, I looked at the size of particle that an N95 can trap. I looked online. It says it goes as low as 0.3 microns. Then I looked at the size of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, 
and it says the size is 0.06 to 0.14 with the average being 0.1 micron. So I look at this and I go, the virus looks like it's three times smaller than what the N95 traps. So I have a scientific mathematical question, like how does this work if the mask, um, you know, holes are actually three times larger than the virus size? So that's my first question. It's a math question. Second of all, I've watched demonstrations online where people spray an aerosol inside the mask and then they breathe out and everything comes out of the mask. So I'm going to ask the questions of efficacy. Is a mask effective or not? I personally have boosted my immune system with vitamin C, vitamin D. I've um, taken host defense, which is a mushroom product, which boosts the natural killer cells, which kill viruses, eaten low sugar, and I have not gotten sick this entire time. And I've been out the entire time for two and a half years so my opinion is if you boost your immune system and you keep your immune system strong then maybe that's the best approach if the masks are actually too big to keep the viral particles out and this is an issue I have not heard addressed today and the N95 is a good mask the other ones are even bigger so I've not heard this discussed today about efficacy of the mask and I would love to hear it addressed so thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. DJ Alex, please go ahead. Uh, hello, can you guys hear me? Yes, we can. Oh, hi, hi. Good evening. Um, good, good evening, fellow board members. My name is Alex Reyes. I am a fellow writer and a disabled person. I would like to recommend that the board imposes the mask mandate. The reason I ask that is because with COVID cases on the rise, we would like to keep our fellow writers and, our em and your employees safe and as, large, as, as long as the community, excuse me, please excuse me, please excuse me. What I'm trying to say is that I fully support this measure of keeping the mask mandate in place. I know there's been a lot of debate these last couple of days and I know you guys were reversing your course of um, reversing the court, re, um, shifting course by removing the mask mandate about 10 days ago, but then you're putting it back. But I fully, fully support this measure and I yield the rest of my time. Thank you. Thank you so much. Is there anyone else who wishes to make a public comment on the mask requirement? I'll give you a second to raise your hand and then we will close public comment. Seeing none, we will now close public comment and turn to the board discussion. So would any directors like to speak? I'll, I'll go, President Salzman, just so that there's comments on here. Um, first, I really want to thank Director Dufty for um, really pushing on this issue. Um, and really listening to uh, the community, particularly the, the disability community on this. Um, I would also say um, I just always really appreciate the number of folks who called in to really engage with the board. This is exactly why we have evening meetings to hopefully be able to increase access and participation in these meetings. Um, and I, I want to uh, shout out uh, Senior Disability Action in particular for taking time and organizing a group of folks to meet with President Saltzman, BART staff, and me to share your experiences as seniors, people with disabilities, and uh, immunocompromised individuals who rely on BART. Um, as I am none of those categories of individuals, um, I know it's really on me to hear your experiences um, and to make policies uh, in ways that can keep all of our riders safe given all the things that many people say. So um, to cut to the chase, I support this. Um, I, I don't know if it, uh, District Secretary, uh, if I could be like added as a sponsor to this as well, um, but I, I look forward to voting yes on this. And um, I, I am glad of the language that we have to ensure that this doesn't lapse before we can take action on it. Um, I will note that BART, remains one of the very, very few transit systems in the entire country, in the state, in the Bay Area, that actually has a mask mandate. Um, at the end of the day, 
you know, this would all be made easier if our county health departments, state health departments, if the, you know, CDC, um, the federal government um, made a decision on this. Uh, but because that has not happened, um, we are doing what we feel is right for our riders by extending uh, this mask mandate forward. Um, so with that, uh, thank you. Thank you, Director Foley. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, the Contra Costa Health Department's current guidelines on masking is the following. Wearing a mask is an easy way to help stop your respiratory droplets from reaching others and to avoid breathing in droplets from others. Everyone is strongly encouraged, and that's emphasized, to wear masks indoors regardless of vaccination status. As a board, we have an obligation to protect our employees, our riders, and the public. I believe masks make BART safer. Uh, for the last two years, our employees have done a phenomenal job of dealing with COVID and all of the protocols we put forward. Um, as I previously stated, now I don't want our station agents, train operators, or system service workers being asked to enforce this rule. Uh, the BART Police Department should be given the latitude, as they have in the past, to enforce this code of conduct using education, free masks, and if necessary, citations and ejections. They are professionals. Let them do their job, enforcing our rule, not theirs. Thank you. Thank you. Director Rayburn. Thank you, and I wonder if any of the board appointed officers have heard from any of our five county health departments, actually six, including Berkeley. The general manager's office has not. And I don't believe uh, Matt Burles or Chris Scan or any of the BOAs have heard anything, okay. uh, Director Raver. Can, can I just add to that too? You know, after we passed our requirement eight in April, uh, staff helped me send letters to all the health departments. Right. Only two even bothered to respond, um, but said they weren't planning to do anything. And our staff has, and I really appreciate them for it, been reaching out to the health departments in the past few weeks to ask about what their plans are, to ask about what their measurements are. And it's we haven't been able to get responses. So they, they've been working on trying to communicate with them. So those of you that were on the meeting at 4 p.m. saw that I was double masked because I'm in BART headquarters and I was around others. Uh, now the door's closed and I'm no longer around anyone else. Um, I always double mask indoors and on the trains. And as a BART director, I've made absolutely certain that we're running all long trains that permits passengers to socially distance and that we have superior air filtration and circulation. Um, it, it's mass mandates represent an emergency measure that really is most widely heeded when it's issued by a health official. I'm, I'm concerned that we have not heard that call. And in fact, the most recent data show that uh, the state on Tuesday reported 43 new daily cases per 100,000 residents down from 49. Um, a few weeks ago. And the Bay Area is showing improvements with 38 cases per 100,000 as of Tuesday, a 21% drop since July 12th. Until the health departments again mandate indoor masks, I will not vote for a mandate. Thank you. Thank you, Director Allen. Thank you. Um, I wanted to point out that in bullet point number five of the resolution, it states this, failure to abide by this code of conduct requirement will result in the immediate removal of the rider from the paid areas of the BART system. That's a pretty bold statement in this resolution. Um, and so I'm wondering if Chief Alvarez is available. Just a one quick question. Yes, Director Allen, I am. 
So I think I asked you this back in April, um, how many people, you know, had we cited? I think it was my question then. And I believe you said that we had cited seven people in the two years previous for mask violations. Was that correct? Am I right about that? Yeah, that's correct. Yeah. Um, And I don't know if we even talked about ejecting people. Um, Did you have a number on how many people we ejected? I don't, but just okay. going off uh, talking to my uh, command staff, those are very few and far between. Uh, it'd okay. be if I had a guess, it'd be under five. Okay, um, and so you know the question is kind of the same. Here's a resolution that says um, your police officers are going to eject people for not following this mandate, and I'm asking you, do you? Th- are are you going to instruct police officers to do that? Is that what we are going to do? Because I'm hearing from riders everywhere uh, on both sides of this, and in my own um, my own constituents, it's it's really mixed. But I'd have to say that more people are saying no mass mandate than saying put it back in place. So my question to you, Chief, um, is this: Are are you going to instruct? our officers to issue citations and actually this policy doesn't even say citations it says eject them what are we going to do so our our enforcement posture is not going to change it's been very effective over the last two plus years and and that is to educate our writers and for those that don't uh wear a mask or don't have a mask we will always give them a mask and our last result our, our last uh opportunity to get the mask if they don't want to go with that we will uh cite them and then ask them to leave. Okay. Um, but but we really haven't been doing that. And I can understand why. And, 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 you know, here's the thing. We have all these other rules that are actually violations of state law in our system that we have a tough time enforcing, like smoking and, um, you know, fair evasion and uh, all the other, um, you know, the, the crime, the criminal activity, theft, um, we struggle to enforce those things. And every time we do, every time we enforce with a police officer, it is a contact and it leads to potential use of force, which I know everyone on this board has been concerned with in the past is increasing our potential for use of force. So um, I think, um, so thank you. That's Those are the questions I have for you, Chief. Um, and then I do have a, a question for staff. Um, uh, and it's along the lines of one of the callers who's, you know, are you going to present scientific data on the efficacy of masks and, um, you know, what other health departments are asking us to do? No presentation? No, Director Allen, we do not have a presentation of that data. Okay, so we have no science to present. I think, you know, some callers have tried to present some of the science in their comments. Um but um, I, you know, I, I didn't support this policy last time. I abstained due to a lack of information. But here's what I, I see us back here in the same spot. No presentation from staff, no scientific data. Um, we have a police chief who has said it's very difficult and we probably won't do much enforcement, but we'll just hand out masks and ask people to, um, to comply, which we can certainly do without this mandate. We can certainly do that. Um, so I have a really hard time with, with putting in place, um, uh, you know, these types of code of, con- code of conduct uh, rules where we know that it's not really going to be enforced. Um, we hear that from writers all the time. And that actually puts us as a board of directors in a difficult position where the writing public now starts writing writing to us and saying, oh, you have a mass mandate, but you're not enforcing it. What's wrong with you? Okay, because they see it. They see it's not being enforced. So it's, it's you know, we're in the spot here where the writing public is not going to have confidence in us if we put things in place as mandates, but then we don't enforce it. And I think we're better off without the mandate, but highly encouraging and continuing the same um, the same work that we've been doing of educating writers and handing out masks, I think that is a better um, solution than putting a mandate on the, poli- uh, on the public and then not enforcing it. Um, so I, I, and, and I think this is, um, we're going down a slippery slope 
when we put more and more things and there's another thing that we've recently added to the code of conduct that really cannot be enforced from a, a legal standpoint uh, as well. And, um, you know, we're, we're going to lose the general public on this code of conduct thing if we haven't already. Um, so I, I think putting it in place is worse than, than not putting, you know, than no mandate. Um, I think that we should leave public health policy to public health officers and follow suit with the county health officers of the counties that we travel through. They seem to all be in agreement and for the most part, with a few exceptions, kind of working in the same direction. Uh, LA County recently lifted their mask mandate um, that was put in place in their county. Um, and, uh, you know, finally, no data has been presented here. Um, I, I know I've read some of the information that the caller referenced about differences in the effect, if, efficacy of masks. Um, and it's real. Uh, I think there's plenty of data on that. Um, so we've had two sessions, both times, no data. I abstained last time, but I believe I'm going to be a no this time. Thank you, Director McPartland. Second, but for openers, I'm going to support it. Um, uh, I will have to end up saying that uh, uh, the caller that identified the uh, degree of microns of the uh, COVID virus being smaller than the uh, capability of the N95 uh, kind of uh, uh, pricked my curiosity. And so I made a telephone call to the uh, guy that runs uh, uh, AMS for the uh, Berkeley Fire Service Agency. And uh, he pointed out to me uh, about four uh, interesting things. Number one is recommended by CDC. It's also recommended by the California De Department of uh, Public Health. It's also recommended by OSHA. In addition to that, uh, the if you end up taking the uh, virus and you aerosolize it, then the mask is not going to end up being that much uh, effective because of the size of it. However, uh, the virus is droplet borne, which is a significant difference. And the N95 is very, assuming that it's borne, borne properly, is very effective for that. Uh, to aerosolize it, uh, well, I'll give you a uh, apples to apples comparison. Anthrax is all over the place uh, throughout the mid southwest, and it is in the ground and is uh, contracted by uh, contact with the skin. The way that you end up turning it and weaponizing it is to aerosolize it. And so, unless somebody's out there aerosolizing, uh, COVID in order to be able to use it to try to infect people, the N95 worn properly is going to be the best tool that we end up having to protect uh, the individuals. As far as uh, depending upon the county health officers, uh, and I've tracked this not only with BART, but also when I was working in that field, and the county health officers end up making uh, policy decisions independently of one another. And if that were the case, we potentially would end up having a different mask policy in Santa Clara County as we would in Alameda County as we would in, you get the idea. So either we, we do or we don't. And for the caller that uh, says that uh, it should be optional for the people, um, uh, yeah, if I end up going into a facility that uh, uh, I don't feel comfortable or I feel at risk, uh, I end up leaving for people that are on BART trains don't that have to use that as their only means of transportation. They really don't have that option. And as park directors, we are responsible for the safety and welfare of not only the people that we end up uh, transporting and represent, but also the people that we protect the, the public with, our employees. So I'm going to support this. Thank you. Thank you. Um I won't repeat some of what other directors have said in support. I, I agree with most of the statements in support. I, I do want to thank the, the public for being here this evening. Um, I do want to acknowledge for those who are not in favor, this is a difficult situation that we're in. And I actually agree it should be the county health departments or the state or the federal government doing this. 
but they are not. Um, the county health department said when they lifted the mask requirements that they would put it back, you know, if things changed. Things have changed and they have not reinstituted the mask requirement. Not only have they not reinstituted the mask requirement, they have been completely unwilling to share with the public or public agencies how they would measure. So that doesn't even give us the tools to say how we would measure. Because that, I agree, would be better if we had a measurement provided by health professionals. But we don't. So we're left in this tremendously difficult situation where we are not the best people to do this. But we are the only ones left because other decision makers have failed us and have failed to even provide what their decision making process is, which makes, I think, a lot of the community, a lot of the folks who have spoken tonight and emailed us think that they don't ever plan to reinstitute any mask requirements. Um, and I think that's really challenging place to be if um, you are somebody who has a condition that makes it unsafe for you to travel without having everybody else around you wear masks. Um, so it is difficult. Uh, I, I do also acknowledge that our mask compliance before the requirement went away a couple of weeks ago, it had been getting worse. Um, during the morning commute, it was always quite good. In the evening commute, it was a little bit worse, but off peak, it could get quite bad. Um, I have noticed since the mask requirement went away that it's gotten a little bit worse, but honestly hasn't changed a lot, which tells me that actually the vast majority of people who are riders want to be wearing masks and are going to wear them either way. They acknowledge that there is still a lot of COVID spread. I mean, who in the Bay Area doesn't know somebody who has had COVID in the past few weeks? I, I challenge you to find that person. So I think people get it and want to wear masks, whether it's to protect themselves or to protect the people around them. Um, so I don't think what we're doing is radical. It's in line with what our writers want because they're already doing it. We're not requiring it right now. Um, but I do think we need to figure out our long-term plan on this as well. So what I would ask, and this isn't adding to the resolution, but what I want to plan for, for the meeting on September 22nd, is that we can look at whether we're going to extend this or not. But at the same time, I do think we need to provide authority to the general manager um, for whenever our mask requirement ends to be able to move very quickly if things change. Um, so we have been in discussions about this for the past couple of weeks. Originally, um, we thought we could just give authority to the general manager um, and he would be able to do that. And that's what I was going to bring forward tonight. But I found out last week that we could not do that, that to give him the authority, we have to have very prescriptive measures about when he, what would trigger him being able to do that. So there was just not enough time in a week to figure out what those triggers would be. So I would ask staff to work with me and with advocates and health professionals. We have some time till September, a couple of months to figure out what those triggers are so that whenever our requirement ends, if things change, he has the ability to move very quickly. We don't have to have a special board meeting um, because I, I don't want to get into a situation where we have no requirement one county requires it, but not the other counties. And then what do we require just in that one county? It's very confusing. So I think we need to be ready to adjust based on what happens. Um, so that's that's what I would ask to come back at the same time. And again, that's not a change to this resolution, um, but it is just something I want to come back at the same time. Um, I think those are all my comments on this. Um, do we have any further director comments? Bevan, I don't know if you want to wrap it up. And we, we, can go we, to have an amendment. we have an amendment pending, so I, we can just go to that. I don't know if that requires a vote or if it can just, if the language can be amended. Do you mean what you said at the beginning? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think you made the motion and I seconded it. So Matt, that's okay, right? We don't need to do anything else? That's correct. There was just a draft resolution in the packet and the motion has been made. Only one motion has been made and it requires um, has a change from September 8th to September 22nd. Great. Okay. Super. We can vote. Great. Let's go to the vote. Director McPartland. Aye. 
Director Rayburn? No. Director Simon? Director Allen? No. Director Ames? Yes. Director Dufty? Yes. Director Foley? Aye. Vice President Lee? Yes. President Saltzman? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries with Directors Allen and Rayburn voting now. Thank you. We will now move on to item nine, which is general public comment. So this is for public comment for anything that is not on our agenda this evening. If you're here to speak on another item, please hold those comments until we reach that item. So let's go to the first speaker in general public comment. Speaker whose number ends in 0755, please go ahead. Sharing your screen. Speaker, please go ahead while we pull up the timer. Oh, I'm very sorry. Um, I'm very sorry. I tried to make a comment earlier, but had technical difficulties and was knocked out of the meeting several times. So my comments are about the mask mandate, uh, but can you just clarify for me what you just voted for? We voted to extend the mask requirement until October 1st, um, but you can go ahead and make your comment. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. And I think the education is really important. Uh, we had one caller come in and say N95 masks don't work, the virus is too small. We had another one saying vaccines are all you need. Education is so important. I would love to see BART continue to educate the public by putting up posters throughout the trains, throughout the stations that explain these facts. Uh, that would help a lot because people are so confused by misinformation. And if they understood the facts, they would be compliant. They would be wearing, wearing the mask without you putting a mandate in. So I appreciate that you just passed this resolution and thank you for your leadership. We desperately need it. People are getting very despondent as, as looking at our public health officers, not taking responsibility to protect us. And so your leadership is a beam of hope. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker. Speaker whose number ends in 2997, please go ahead. Hi, this is Joe Kunzler. Um, I just want to call in briefly and just thank the world famous BART board for standing up for what's right and passing a mask mandate. And I want to respond to some of the board members' comments. First, I, I don't agree with Director Allen's vote, but I certainly respect her concerns. I think those were the kind of thoughtful questions that I think that we need. Those were good faith questions as well. And I want to rise in Director Allen's defense because I think we need a strong, loyal opposition bench um, that's going to ask serious questions about the consequences of our advocacy. Second, I fully share President Saltzman's absolute hurt and frustration at the public health. I know they've been bullied, and I my heart goes out to them. But we need them to stand strong. And let me tell you, what. and I was part of that meeting last week you may have heard about between disability advocates and BART leaders. One of the things I had to bring up was just a horrible, horrible way that how Washington State Central Puget Sound gave in to the mob and decided to undo the mask mandate. And now one of the transit agencies is having a new mob of unvaccinated ex-employees beg for their jobs back. And as I, I told, I want all of you to know that I felt that was next for you, Bart, and I don't want that to happen to you. I don't want anything bad to happen to you. You hold a very special place in the hearts of transit advocates because of the kind of people you have as leaders who are thoughtful and deliberate and strategic. And I'm not just talking about Mrs. Elisa Trost. I'm talking about this board. I'm talking about every employee. You are role models for the nation, and you are answering the call. And now it's time for everybody else to get on board and let's, get, let's build back better. And I want to congratulate you on your 50th birthday if I don't get to call in again later. Thank you so much for all you do. Thank you. Next speaker.
Alita, please go ahead. Uh, thank you again, uh, President Hello. Rebecca Saltzman and members. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her we'll talk generally here. It's good to be back with you. Um, I hope you got to see my letter. I like to think that my letters are somewhat entertaining and engaging and sharing of my feelings and stories about my life on public transportation, etc. And so lately, I think a lot about the importance of an inclusive system. Uh, I, I wish we had more consistent demographics uh, in our various reports across our system. And because demographics are predicated on definitions and because I am a person who does not meet societally established definitions, then unless the demographic has a place that is a catch-all, uh, that causes me to be excluded by default. You know, that's got to change. I should never have to feel that I could be potentially excluded from this system simply because of who I am. Uh, it, it, it has not happened. But uh, no one should have to be worried about being ejected from the system because they wear skirts, especially if they are paying fair and follow the rules of conduct. So I think our demographics have to be consistent across the board in recognizing the diversity of our riding public. Uh, because I'm a person just as much. Yes, there are people who may not agree with that, but I have to stand up for who I am. I use BART every day. I used it today. I ask that you think about the importance of inclusive demographics because BART is indeed simply this. It's the people system. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 4191, please go ahead. Hello. First, I want to thank the majority of the board for in, uh, voting for this important public safety measure. I am so grateful that I'm going to be able to ride in reasonable safety again um, and to ride with, and that my loved ones and people in my community can ride without uh, getting risking long COVID uh, or for people who are um, at high risk of severe illness from COVID, uh, risking even worse. Uh, I think it's so important also that you have a strong public messaging campaign uh, regarding the importance of wearing masks, regarding that there is a mask requirement, regarding that free masks are available at the station agent, and ex which also explains exactly why people need to wear masks. A lot of people don't think it's important. They think because mistakenly think because they're vaccinated and boosted like uh, one of the callers did that they're fine, but they're not. They're at risk of long COVID. And if they have um, uh, perhaps a health, you know, and a health complication they're not familiar with, they may be risk of even worse. And long COVID itself can be so devastating. So I'm hoping also your public messaging can talk about uh, the importance of wearing those high filtration, well-fitting masks for a reputable source. And reputable source is important because uh, there's plenty of KN95 counterfeits out there, which aren't so good. So um, I also hope that uh, last I saw you were just giving out surgical masks at the station agent, which certainly are better than nothing. But uh, a KN95 or even better an N95 or a KF94 from reputable source would be better to give out. And hopefully there'll be sizes for children as well as for adults. Um, I, it's to, I, I believe Director Ames at the previous media, uh, when, uh, for the previous requirement was talking about, uh, she wasn't sure the effectiveness if there weren't, um, the high filtration mask. Any mask is better than no mask. Um, however, those high filtration masks really are best. So you can help by a public messaging campaign and by having free, um, high filtration masks that are designed to fit people well, including kids. Um, so thank you uh, for your, your comments. Your, your two minutes are up. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 3920, please go ahead. Hi, uh, my name is Jen. I'm um, with Senior and Disability Action. I called in earlier and I just wanted to say thank you so much to everyone who voted to pass 
um, the resolution to reinstate the mask mandate. Um, it means so much more than you know. Um, you know, I, I hear some of the um, board uh, members' comments saying that why should why should we do this if the the public health, you know, county health officers haven't done it. And I, I agree that it's unfair that you guys are in the position to step up and, and have leadership and do this. Um, but to the people who opposed it, it's because of political decisions, not because of public health. So I want to thank all the board members who voted yes um, to, to pass the mask mandate. Um, I really, really appreciate your leadership. And I hope we can use what you guys have done here today to leverage at the county level so that it, it gets reinstated at the county level. Thank you so much. Thank you. Next speaker. Thank you. Elizabeth, please go ahead. Hi. Yes, um, my name is Elizabeth. I um, called in earlier with Senior and Disability Action, and I just wanted to say thank you so much for passing this. It is going to save lives. It's going to save people from getting long COVID. It's it's going to make a big difference, and. Um, uh, I really commend your bravery uh, and your leadership because, um, you know, it, it's it's true that right now, unfortunately, uh, we're not able to rely on um, our public health officers to to do the right thing in terms of, um, you know, taking more mitigation measures at a time when we have sky high levels in the Bay Area um, to reduce transmission. Um, there. They're not taking the actions they need to, and you guys are stepping up. Um, and it's also, I really agree with the point that was brought up that, like, when when you have different uh, counties with different health departments too, that also, you know, provides its own set of challenges because unless they're all in agreement, you might have to disagree with one of them anyway. Um, and I just wanted to really stress too that mandates are so important, even if they cannot be, you know, enforced 100%. It still gives a very different message, and it's not that's not to be underestimated. Yes, people who are, are masking now will continue to, but for there are many who aren't masking right now who I'm sure are just thinking, you know, um, you know, just in good faith, like, well, it must not be that bad right now because the public health department would tell us, you know, if we needed to be masking now, we'd we'd have a mask mandate in place, and so. Like when you have a mandate, it's a very different message from a strong recommendation, and that gives people the message, um, you know, that it's it's needed, and more people, you know, even if there's not 100% perfect compliance, um, that can't be underestimated. So thank you, thank you for doing the right thing. Thank you. Right, is there anybody else who would like to make a general public comment for an item not on the agenda? Seeing none, we can move on in our agenda to the administration items. We have just one item on the collective bargaining agreements. Um, since Chair Simon is not here in the meeting anymore, she asked me to um, facilitate this part of the meeting. Um, so I, I will do that. So I will turn it over to staff for the presentation. Thank you, President Simon. This is Pamela Herhold, Assistant General Manager for Performance and Budget. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to David Coleman. He's our Interim Director of Labor Relations. Uh, good evening, Directors. <clears throat> uh, I'll just wait a second while we get the presentation up. So <clears throat> we're here based uh, to vote on the ratification of the collective bargaining agreements between the district and its five labor partners. Uh, our labor partners approached the district in early May uh, due to a variety of factors, which we'll go over in this presentation. The background and context for uh, that approach was that inflation is currently affecting everybody, including BART employees. In all cases, uh, the U.S., including the Bay Area, is seeing inflation not seen in 40 years. And uh, the year-over-year -year increase for 2022 is higher than 8%, rising to even 9% uh, in the month of June. Current ridership trends, which are uh, projected to be below the baseline needed for the ridership-based increases that we have in the current contract, would lead us to a three-year contract of zero increases if they hold. 
Uh, peer agencies in the time since we've negotiated our contracts have also given out increases in current and future years, which would provide a labor-friendly environment for bargaining we were to go through in 2024. Uh, additionally, the relative decline of BART wages compared to those peer agencies exacerbates our current recruitment and retention issues. Just to kind of put a fine point on that, you can see here that the baseline um, for inflation nationally over 2021 over 2022 is over 8%. Uh, it's been that way the entire year and shows no signs of letting up. Further, just to reorient you, in our current contracts, we have wage increases based on ridership recovery uh, that we don't project to be met in either fiscal year 23 or 24, as it would require over 60% of pre-COVID ridership to even begin to uh, institute wage increases. In that context, BART is currently looking at three potential zeros in a row in their current contracts, while other comparator agencies such as AC Transit, SFMTA, VTA, and LA Metro have seen increases or planned increases in those years of anywhere between 9 and 14%. This would place us directly behind our comparators in an environment that is already hard to recruit and retain in. So with that in mind, <clears throat> the district and its labor partners so far, uh, based on your ratification, have reached a one-year extension of all labor in agreements. For ASME ATU and SEIU, that would extend their agreements to June 30th, 2025. And for BPMA and BPOA, it would extend their contracts to June 30th, 2026. The wage increases would take place in the remaining years of the extended contracts. For ASME ATU and SEIU, that would be 3.5% on July 1st of this year retroactive. 3% on July 1st of 2023 and 4% on July 1st of 2024. For the BPMA and BPOA, because their contracts extend one year further, uh, July 1st, 2022, we would retroactively give a 2% increase. July 1st, 2023, a 2% increase again. July 1st, 2024, a 3% increase. And July 1st, 2025, a 3.5% increase. In having this discussion with our labor partners, we wanted to stretch for efficiency gains and some cost <clears throat> controls uh, that we thought would help the district operate in its current fiscal status and also with the uh, staffing shortages we're currently facing. In terms of operational efficiency gains, uh, we have agreement to cap compensatory time use at 180 hours per fiscal year. That would reduce uh, overtime reliance and backfill overtime and ensure greater staff coverage in a lot of our key areas. Additionally, the police department would be able to eliminate the 410 scheduling requirements for sergeants and lieutenants, giving them a greater ability to adjust work schedules to match departmental needs. Additionally, uh, in our train operations, we would be able to get event flexibility by allowing part-time employees to bid for special event trains, providing better service coverage and less missed runs on those extended days where we want to do special events. Additionally, we would also be able to move to an electronic bidding system that would provide a more efficient use of employee time and shrink the amount of effort that we have to put into bidding every six months uh, in order to provide better service coverage. On the future cost constraint side, we got a couple of items that will allow us to right size our current workloads, uh, create subclassifications that will provide support at a lower cost, as well as increased staffing flexibility, especially in our capital projects, uh, as well as encouraging retention through career ladders and multiple promotional opportunities. Additionally, we have some agreements that will provide for a better division of work, assignment of appropriate staff to address shifting needs, and better utilize the cur current resources we have. And finally, we have an item that will limit vacation accruals moving forward, leading to future budget reductions and saving on unfunded liabilities. Uh, you'll see in the two charts above the fiscal impact of the potential wage increase. As you'll see, we've split it out between operating costs and capital costs because we wanted to identify the impact on the fiscal runway we've talked so much about. Um, so here you'll see over the four years, each fiscal year's fiscal impact, and then a four-year total at the end. And I'll just point out that you'll see that curve kind of bend downward in the out years because in fiscal 25 and 26, our current budgeting includes a 2% wage escalation automatically. So the fiscal impact here would be 
anything over and above that 2% already budgeted for. Additionally, we wanted to make sure we were fully transparent, and so we provided you a capital cost, which, as you all know, are primarily reimbursable and will have little impact on our fiscal runway, uh, and those costs spread out over a four-year total. So with that, uh, I'm happy to, uh, well, I'll put forward, just for everybody's knowledge, the resolution is in front of you. Uh, it, is the, it is the ratification of five separate agreements with AFSME, ATU, SEIU, and both BART Police Associations, Managers Association, and the Officers Association for the times indicated in the presentation. With that, uh, I'm happy to take any questions the board may have. Thank you. Uh, first, we'll go to public comment. Let's go to the first speaker. Caller whose number ends in 3993, please go ahead. Good evening, Bart Board, President Saltzman and General Manager Powers. My name is Sal Cruz, President of the American Federation of State, County, Municipal Employees, Local 3993. The vote before you may be your most consequential yet. Every public agency in the region is facing the same challenges. No one could have foreseen the labor and economic conditions we find ourselves in today. The pandemic continues to challenge us in ways no one could have predicted. I cannot imagine the position BART would be in if we did not do this. Recent negotiated labor contract agreements in the region have left BART less competitive. Neighboring public agencies are catching up. Their labor agreements reflecting the rise in inflation and cost of living. Not doing so would accelerate the loss of good employees. We must do what is necessary to retain and recruit great employees. Our technology and processes are unique to BART, and with that comes the responsibility to maintain a skilled and trained workforce that will continue providing safe and reliable service to the Bay Area. More importantly, this labor agreement provides BART the space and flexibility to explore alternative funding sources in the coming years without the uncertainty of a long protracted BART labor negotiation. This labor agreement will not solve all of our problems. It will require taking a hard look at existing programs, expanding opportunities, and improving health and safety to make BART more attractive. In a sense, we'll have to reinvent ourselves over the coming years and strengthen the labor management partnership. I urge the BART board to vote to ratify the labor agreements before you. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. Jesse, please go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Good evening, BART Board of Directors, President Saltzman. Uh, my name is Jesse Hunt, and I am the president of the Amalgamated Transit Union, Local 1555, representing BART's frontline transportation workers. I'd first like to recognize uh, the general manager and BART staff for the foresight uh, to participate in uh, these good faith uh, bargaining sessions and with a focus on the long-term success of BART in those discussions that have led to the proposals in front of us today. This proposal takes important steps towards recognizing the commitment and ongoing effort of our members uh, since the beginning of this pandemic and the continued effort to bring BART, uh, BART riders back to the system. Our members have worked tirelessly to keep the Bay Area moving in the face of the unprecedented challenges of the last, past couple of years. Now, this proposal does not represent everything that our members need and deserve and will still face challenges over the next three years, particularly relating to safety and security and the critical staffing needs that BART faces. But this proposal does take a much needed step in the right direction. We urge the BART board to vote yes, and we thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next speaker. Caller whose number ends in 0141, please go ahead. Good evening, President Salzman, BART board members, and general manager powers. John Arantes, SEIU 1021, BART chapter president. As we all face incredible, unexpected challenges like high inflation, eating away at BART workers' wages, and BART facing a never, be, a never before seen hiring challenge of being able to hire qualified and skilled workers at a time that an avalanche of current employees in retirement age are opting to retire now not seeing any financial incentives to stay any longer. All this put together is leading to a qualified workforce shortage that will lead to a total failure of BART being able 
to provide a safe and reliable system that the Bay Area demands. Working cooperatively, BART unions and BART management have come together to find solutions to address all these concerns. I applaud the BART board for taking these challenges and having the wisdom and courage to take the needed steps to address the current chaos that we face. I ask the BART board to vote yes on the proposed contract extensions as our members have done. Thank you and have a good evening. Thank you. Next speaker. Shane, please go ahead. Hello, I'm Shane Reese with the BART Police Officer Association, the Vice President. Um, I'd like to state and thank management um, because this has truly been a joint effort between the unions and management in order to retain current employees and attract un un to attract qualified workers. Um, as you saw, other transit agencies, their wages are currently going up, and uh, this is going to go a long ways towards retaining and staying competitive in this market and to uh, get the best workers available. This extension will help BART maintain a high level of service and eventually attract riders back to the system. Thank you. Thank you. Next speaker. There you guys go. You can be, go back to being loud as you want. Pardon me. I am Lieutenant Nick Mavrakis of the BART Police Department's Managers Association. Our association voted overwhelmingly in support of this ratification. On behalf of the BART Police Managers Association, we support the BART Board ratifying the contract extension. We appreciated the collaboration with the BART District and the leadership of General Manager Robert Bowers and his management team to get this agreement completed. Thank you. Thank you. Would anyone else from the public like to comment on this item? Seeing no further public speakers, we will now go to the board discussion. Can I, can I move the item, Madam President? Would that be okay just to move? Yes. I have a lot to second it. So we have a motion and a second. Now we'll go to discussion. Director Rayburn. I only want to reflect back on 2013 and the 180 degree turn that we've made. Uh, BART is a big team and everybody is pulling together. And they, this effort didn't start three months ago with the negotiations. It started during the pandemic and, and even before. But during the pandemic, it was those workers that were coming in before we had masks to hand out. And they were dedicated and they accepted a contract that had all those goose eggs in it. And all we could do is say, don't worry, we're gonna get through this, but first we have to just keep running the trains and provide the service. Thank you everyone for your efforts and for hanging in there with us. And as you can see from the data, the comparisons with our peers in the Bay Area, as well as throughout the nation, um, we're not, we're not breaking the bank on this. This is an essential move to keep the Bay Area running. Thank you. Thank you. Director Ames. So, um, this is really hard for me to convey my thoughts. Um, you know, I just, you know, the soul of BART are the people. It's the employees and it's the transit riders. I want to give the employees livable wage jobs you know, the transit riders, fair gates. Uh, you know, I want the cleaner stations with the, you know, um, scrub crews. But, you know, the, the sadly, BART is dependent on federal emergency funds to run the agency. We approved a two-year budget in, you know, this year. Um, and in that budget, it had three, uh, approximately 300 million per year so for this year and next, that was going to be the stimulus funds that kept BART afloat. And then in the third year, this is 2025, we got an update, I guess, and this was in April, that we would have approximately 200 million left in 2025. 
And that's what the projections that we, we did. We did project a downturn in 2024. Uh, we got very minimal sales tax revenues, dramatically less than what we thought we were going to get this year. I think this year we were looking at a $40 million increase in sales tax revenues. Next year was just in 24, it was 11 million in additional revenue. Meaning we're going to have a potential recession, which was great that we planned this for, we planned for that. But, you know, if we have 200 million left with these correct, these assumptions, and we have 200 million left in 2025, and then we go ahead with this $100 million, approximately $100 million wage increase, we really only have 100 million left of federal emergency funds in 2025. So I would like to do something more shorter term, uh, but we don't have a plan to meet our obligations, I believe, without raising taxes in the end. This is potentially in 2025. Uh, I'd like to see a financial plan, uh, you know, so that we don't have the situation happen. So I appreciate what the union representatives, of representatives are saying that, you know, we're going to expand possibly on the efficiencies of BART. We're going to do, you know, a plan, you know, you know, I would say, you know, business unusual. This is what I'd like to see in the next two years before the money runs out, potentially in 25. So I'm going to abstain on this, but I do mm -hmm. the need to increase wages in the short term, at least for two, two years, just because we didn't predict that, you know, we were going to, we thought we were going to be at 60% ridership by now. And now nobody's getting any increase, but I do see a problem just three years from now. So I hope that makes sense. And I look forward to working with the staff, with the unions, um, to, with a plan, a realistic plan of how we're going to position ourselves. Okay. Thank you. Before I go to director Foley, I, I just wanted to see if, Pam or Bob or whoever can address, you know, we, we have plans to come back in a couple months to talk more about our budget and our plans for the next few years. But if you could address briefly kind of the actual impact of this and, and when you will be coming back to us to discuss that. Um, absolutely, Director. This is Pamela Herhold. So we will be coming back to just have some very, I think, intense discussions with you when we um, uh, come with the revised uh, MTC expectations for a short-range transit plan, and that will be sometime this fall. Um, we will have numerous touch points with you for the budget as we close fiscal year 22. Um, and that is a good news story. We actually managed to come out a little bit better than, it, actually substantially better than expected for fiscal year 22. Um, and then we'll be, of course, seeing you quite a bit to, from the winter um, and the spring as we develop next year's budget. And then also, um, based upon the actions the board just took this evening, we'll be back to see you with a revised budget. So there'll be a number of touch points, some longer term in nature, some shorter term in nature. Thank you. Director Foley. Thank you, Madam President. Let me get to my notes if I could. Um, I'd like to thank uh, Bob Powers, David Coleman, Pam Herhold, um, and our union leadership, Sal, Jesse, John, Shane, Nick, Olivia, um, for coming together, uh, working collaboratively to reach an agreement to extend their contracts, which also provides operational efficiencies to BART. This is not a one-way street. We're helping each other out. Um, these changes allow BART to remain a competitive employer in the Bay Area. As you saw earlier, as we extend our wage freeze, we become less competitive and less attractive. It's a recruitment and retention issue. And right now, it is so very difficult, as you've heard from the chief, to even bring on board officers. We are in a very competitive market and anything we can do to posture ourselves in a better position, we should take advantage of that. Um, and I also wanna be clear, these increases are not a raise. They are simply an attempt to try to keep up with inflation, and they don't. This is really trying to keep up with the Joneses, and the Joneses are still ahead. Um, and, and I just want to conclude with, you know, our employees have done everything we've asked during the pandemic. We've thrown mask mandates at them. We've thrown vaccine mandates. We've asked them to come to work every day 
during the highest peaks of COVID and ensure that our trains never stopped running. And they did that. The least we can do is recognize the commitment that they've made to the Bay Area and this public agency and recognize the fact that they've done everything that we've asked them to do. And I want to thank everyone who's worked together to make this happen. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Dufty. Thank you. And I'm sorry, due to um, Wi-Fi issues, I'm not on camera. I, I want to say how much I appreciate our general manager, Bob Powers' leadership um, throughout the pandemic. And I think having um, the courage and foresight to sit down and negotiate with our labor partners an agreement that I think is very helpful for BART in terms of efficiencies. And I think it shows that this board is committed to the men and women that work for our agency and to understand how difficult this time is and that how much things have changed from what we originally anticipated COVID would be about. I also wanna point out to my colleague, Director Ames, I think that we are blessed to have one of the most extraordinarily tight-fisted chief fiscal officers in Pam Harehold. And I know that you have um, respect for her and have worked closely with her and her team, but you just look at all the ways in which Pam led the effort to curtail spending and to be responsible and to be stingy during the, you know, the early months where we didn't know what it was gonna be like. And she led a department that did an extraordinary job. So I never worry about the, the, the review and the, the rigor and, and the, the you know, completeness of um, what Pam and her team provide. And I just think honestly, that w how can we sit on the sidelines and not understand how difficult things are for our employees? You can't on one hand talk about them being critical and vital to the experience and to the functioning of our railroad and not say, this is the time, this is a great agreement that is going to help us in so many ways with operational efficiencies. And we're marching together. We are all together here. And so I just say, sitting on the sidelines is not an option as far as I'm concerned. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Allen. Thank you. Um, so, I, I am very sympathetic to the workers and the fact that there have been no raises in the last one year for some and future raises under this current contract from 2021 are um, unlikely given our ridership um, numbers and projections, uh, unlikely for the next two to three years for the rest of this contract. We should be talking about how to give our workers raises given the inflationary times that we're in. And we should be talking about employee retention and attraction. Right. And I was all in favor of, of us talking about those things. But before we as a board replace this, the 2021 agreements, um, which are really only a year old, we should have been negotiating the most expensive and inefficient parts of our labor contracts including all aspects, wages, benefits, worker safety, uh, particularly the work rules that lead to excessive overtime, uh, co overtime costs and operational inefficiencies uh, and the cost overruns. Those items should be collectively bargained all at once. I'm not convinced by the list of operational efficiency items in the presentation that this bargaining was done to the best of our ability. Staff was unable to tell me what BART's cost savings would be, would, be, would be realized for those six items. In 2019, we were carrying 425,000 riders per weekday. And now because of COVID and other issues, BART is carrying 35% of that. BART is struggling as we watch the fiscal cliff come closer and closer. With these labor agreement changes, the cliff comes six months more closer, costing us another $166 million over the next four years. I think under these circumstances that all parties should be, should be anxious to sit down and renegotiate the entire agreement, everything, in exchange for an agreement that guarantees increased and fair wages for fair work. We must assure that the taxpayers we must also assure that the taxpayers and riders 
paying for this system, that we are serious about advancing efficiencies of how we operate for the future. We're only one year into a three-year contract that was rushed through in December of 2020, where BART gave up key work rule provisions in the eBART contract in exchange for the current wage agreements. We can't get back those eBART efficiencies that we gave up uh, if we now replace that contract with what is before us today. Now, here we are again a year later being forced to make another rushed decision. In three short months, we've, done, we've, we've gone from start to finish on these contracts because, you know, as I was told, uh, BART management doesn't think that they can realistically open the entire contract and rene renegotiate the full contract. No compensation and benefit surveys have been presented to us. All we got were comparisons of some percentage wage increases of three other agencies. All of this was done behind closed doors until today uh, without the public's involvement. And the analysis and comparative data presented has, has not been sufficient to convince me that these four-year replacement agreements are the best that we can do for the Bay Area. So regrettably, I cannot support these agreements today. Uh, thank you. Um, Vice President Lee, if you're okay, I'd like to actually get in the queue now and then I'll, I'll go to you next. Um, first, I wanna echo the comments of Director Rayburn, Foley and Dufty. You all had very eloquent things to say about why this is so important and I won't repeat those. Um, but I do also want to thank um, uh, uh, General Manager Powers and his whole team and all of the labor leaders. Um, I do have to say, you know, I, I disagree with this idea that we didn't do, you know, what was best for the agency, that we didn't look at everything. Because I was here in 2013 and Director McPartland and Rayburn were here with me and some of the labor leaders were as well. And I, I think we made a mistake that year. What we did was we kind of pursued everything and not just that was on the board and management side and that was on the labor side. And they were negotiating over dozens and dozens and dozens of items, some of which were not the biggest items that we needed to deal with. And it made it challenging to focus on what were the most important things. And it took an immense lot, amount of time um, an immense amount of disruption to the Bay Area. So I think where we've moved to since then about negotiating on the things that are the most important to us is the smart thing to do. And it's possible to do in a few months because these are things that have been discussed over the years and prepared for. So they didn't just come up with these off the top of their head. They It was things that management have been thinking about and talking to labor leaders about and that's why they were able to get this done so quickly and they were able to get it done so quickly because of the relationships and the trust that they have built and so I think where we are now compared to where we are were in 2013 it's really incredible I don't think most people could have predicted we could have turned around our labor management and board relations in this time considering where they were um, but I think focusing on what is most important is actually the right way to go forward with negotiations so we can be productive and actually acknowledge what is most important instead of trying to look at every single little thing. I also would take issue with EBART. Um, this is something I've been just in discussions with the, the labor unions for several years about. Um, and I told them from the beginning, um, John Arantes can confirm this, that we needed to come <laughs> to an agreement that worked for the agency and for the unions. And they were able to do that. So the, the changes that were made did not cost BART money. Um, actually, it made things work easier because we were running kind of a, a parallel system out there. It was a novel idea. It was worth exploring. It was explored and tried out and it didn't work and it didn't work out for labor and it didn't work out for BART. So I don't think we gave anything away there. And so I don't see anything that we're supposed to be trying to get back because I actually think the system today is, is better than it was. So um, 
I just wanted to address those things. I, I actually think this was a very solid process. Um, it's clearly needed. I mean, <laughs> I think we're all seeing inflation. I just got an email today and about the increase in the price of my daughter's preschool, which I just enrolled her in less than two months ago. And it was shocking to me, um, but I'll manage that. But I think that's the thing that everybody's experiencing right now. You we all budget for our lives. And those of us who are, you know, middle class or make less money than that, we're budgeting very carefully. And when all of a sudden costs go up hundreds of dollars, it's just very tremendously difficult to manage. So these are the real things that BART workers are dealing with. And I think we really need to do this to make sure they can be able to pay their bills. And so we can retain employees. So I think we need to go forward with this today, and I strongly support it. And I'll go next to Vice President Lee. Great. Um, thank you. Um, I want to associate myself with uh, the comments made by Dr. Stufty and Rayburn and just now by President Saltzman. I am strongly in support of this resolution before us right now. Um, there's just a few points I want to make. First, our workers are the backbone of our system. When the pandemic hit, all of us said that. And if we actually believe that, you know, we'd be voting, we'd all be voting yes on this today. And more than ever, we need to retain our current employees and recruit more. And I've heard from our labor partners, I've heard from workers directly, um, that this resolution will take uh, will be a critical step in really addressing the recruitment and retention issue. I mean, all you have to do, you know, I know that with the police vacancies, there's a lot of other things at play, but even just looking at the police vacancies, we're not going to be able to retain and recruit if we can't keep up with other agencies. Um, and we see, you know, we have seen a lot of data um, around uh, what other transit agencies are doing. And if we can't match that, not only are we not going to be able to recruit more folks, but why would you continue working at BART if you see, you know, the raises and the salary increases that other trans agencies are receiving? This, And so if we care about our workers um, and we say that they've been the backbone, they've kept our system running, they are essential workers, they're providing essential trips, and for me, this is really a no-brainer, yes. Second thing I have to do is absolutely thank our management, um, the fact that our labor partners um, came to management um, and said, hey, we want to really create the, you know, we, we want to be able to keep running the system. We want to keep working with you. Um, and they brought this forward um, as a way to address recruitment and retention and also address worker morale. It says a lot about the positivity of the relations that our management and our board have with our labor partners. Um, so I can't give Bob Powers um, enough credit and your whole team um, for, for putting their time here. Um, the third thing here is voting no on this is not going to solve the impending fiscal cliff. So tying this resolution to the fiscal cliff, um, it, it doesn't make sense. Uh, we, we've seen countless budget presentations during the pandemic. We have made significant cuts and we've presented sobering, honest budgets time and time again. Um, I do believe we need a long-term financial plan and exploration of revenue measures and creative revenue mechanisms. I think we've all really talked about that, especially at our board retreats. Um, but voting no on this is not going to solve that. And I truthfully think it's going to put us in a worse situation if this is something that we, we know our budget can withstand and what our labor partners are asking for. Voting no on this is just going to put us in a, we're going to have to spend and invest so much time and energy at our board meetings to address the morale, to address the retention and recruitment issues. Um, and lastly, sort of to uh, some points that Director Allen made regarding those other CBA changes beyond salary increases. If Again, if we vote no on this and this doesn't pass day, we will never have a chance to consider any of those other work changes. Um, so if we, if we do want to open up further conversations, what we have learned is management is willing to come to the table, the board is willing to be nimble, and that we can have conversations um, about work changes outside the contract, and that, you know, we can take actions like this. That is a very different position, I think, that BART uh, is taking now than in the past, and that's great direction. Um, with all that said, I, I really encourage my um, colleagues to vote yes on this today. Thank you.
Thank you. Director McPartland. Thank you. I'm going to be relatively short. Uh, uh, Director Salisbury and uh, Rayburn uh, have already pointed out exactly how difficult the uh, 2009 uh, negotiations were. Uh, I didn't think it would be, uh, could possibly get worse from the, uh, I'm sorry, to the, uh, 2013. Uh, I ended up going through the 2009 and I didn't think it could possibly get worse. And yet it did. Uh, it was divisive. It was uh, toxic. Uh, and uh, we ended up having some major uh, labor problems associated with that that uh, lingered for a long period of time. Prior to that, I had been an employee and we had no problems, or at least I didn't. Uh, and I will have to end up telling you that I'm surprised by this. Uh, I agree with uh, Director Dufty that this is not solution, uh, it, but it's the best compromise that we can end up getting. Uh, one thing that has not been brought out, I think that uh, Director Lee uh, uh, touched on it slightly, and that is that the, when I ended up going through on uh, two of my three careers, uh, people would get into a, a field of um, employment and stay there for their entire career. Uh, since then, the labor market has become a lot more uh, diverse and a lot more mobile. Uh, and there's an old uh, cliche, I don't know if anybody's ever heard it called, uh, 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 see, how's that go uh, uh, with them? What's in it for me? And the attention span, I shouldn't say attention span, but the satisfaction that employees end up having uh puts them in with their job environment, puts them in a position where they're always looking for greener grass. If we end up locking in this, we end up having a carrot that will end up keeping the employees that we have. Would that be a big thing if uh, we ended up losing a lot of our um, uh, employees? It would be destructive to the point where we would have a difficult time trying to continue to operate because of the ramp up time that we have with being able to uh, hire and retain the employees that we end up having. That's true for train operators, that's true for mechanics, and especially that's true for uh, train controllers. We need to end up doing everything that we can in order to be able to maintain the employees that we have and recruit those that will want to end up staying a career with us. So I'm definitely gonna be supporting this. Thank you. Director Allen. Just uh, um, in response to Director Lee, since she uh, directed her comments at, at my comments, um, there is absolutely a connection between the fiscal cliff and the adoption of these agreements. And in fact, in presentations, we had a slide showing us the shortening of the fiscal cliff. So, um, you know, if you spend $166 million uh, that's not in the plan, the point at which you run out of money is going to be closer. Um, with respect to voting no, you know, is, um, is, is that going to change anything? If five directors voted no today and we sent uh, labor and management back to renegotiate um, things like, for example, the double time overtime, uh, that is in the ATU contract that is not in, um, you know, the surrounding regions transit ATU contracts. Um, you know, things like these could be re renegotiated. These are things um, overtime costs us money, um, but there are also work rules that create more overtime that uh, could have been included in these negotiations. So yes, we, we could make change. Um, to, to think that if um, if we adopt this today, that in a year from now, uh, when BART, or let's say in 2024, when we really are running out of money and maybe uh, voter measures, uh, voters don't agree to do new tax measures and we are really nervous about where will the money come from for the next couple of years, I don't suspect that uh, labor partners are going to reopen these contracts unless there are more um, you know, concessions by BART in wages and benefits and so forth. That's that's just the way uh, the history of this negotiating works. In fact, I think it's unusual 
that contracts that were just passed one year ago are suddenly now reopened and replaced. I think I can't can't think of a time that has ever happened. Thanks. So Director Dufty, I see your hand's been up, but I don't know if it's just up before. Do you have an additional comment? Okay. And, and Director Sossman, this is Latifa. I did join again, and I'm going to have to leave again. I'm at an event with my daughter, and I have listened to the conversation. I know that roll call has not been called, but I want to in favorably express my support. I might have to get off. I'm not sure how long this discussion is going to go I, I on. I think we're almost done. Okay. All right. I won't, but I'm, I'm a yes. <laughs> so if there are no further comments, let's go to the vote. Director McPartland? Aye. Director Rayburn? Yay. Director Simon? Yes. Thank you, staff and board, for your work. Director Allen? No. Director Ames? Abstain. Director Dufty? Yes. Director Foley? Aye. Vice President Lee? Yes. President Saltzman? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries with Director Allen voting no and Director Ames abstaining. Thank you. We will now move on to item 11, the engineering and operations items, and I will turn it over to Chair Dufty. Thank you so much. Madam President, can you hear me? Because I, uh, yes. your, your feed was a little slow. Can you hear me all right? Shucks. Oh, you can. Oh, great. Okay. Um, uh, colleagues, I believe that um, everyone who uh, was who accepted uh, a briefing is comfortable with items A and B. And I would like to see if there is not an objection, if we could call those two items together, um, see if there are any public comment speakers and then try and proceed this along given the time. So I am not seeing any objections. So Madam District Secretary, can you see if there are any public comment speakers on items A and B? Yes, we have one hand raised. Great, if we could go. To okay. Alita, please go ahead. Um, thank you. Uh, Committee Chair Bevan Dufty and members Alita Dupree for the record, she and her. I'm going to talk about item B, uh, communication-based train control. I cannot consider myself to be an expert on CBTC, uh, just as I can't consider myself to be an expert on aircraft engines. Uh, but CBTC is important to me, and I have some experience with it, given that I have written the L and the seven lines of the legendary and historic New York City subway over the last few years. And uh, CBTC does make a difference. Um, it helps to optimize the separation of rail vehicles in the space, much like air traffic controllers need to ensure appropriate separation between different sizes of aircraft, uh, given um, the, the issues of things such as wake turbulence. And so as I ride the trains, I, I still find times that the trains are hunting for the exact spot to stop at in the station. They stop and then they start up again. And sometimes people get a little, you know, haven't seen anyone fall over, but they're grabbing onto dear life for uh, something uh, because the train starts up. And so I want our trains to stop and start on the mark the first time. So I want us to be able to optimize our system and therefore I speak that we should pass this item because I want a, a safer, a more reliable and more equitable BART that I use daily when I'm here. So I ask that you pass this item because this will exemplify the idea that BART is not just for some, but it is the people system, thank you. Thank you, Alita, for your support. Um, Madam District Secretary, if no objection, I, I can't see if any of my colleagues are seeking to speak, but if not, I would um, request a, a motion and a second for these two items so we can move forward. Uh, 
Move for approval. Second. Great. We can go to the vote. Director McPartland. Aye. Director Rayburn. Yay. Director Simon. Director Allen. I'm going to abstain. Uh, there's a piece of information that it was still outstanding for me. Director Ames? Yes. Director Dufty? Yes. Director Foley? Aye. Vice President Lee? Yes. President Saltzman? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries with Director Allen abstaining and item 11A carrying by the required two thirds vote. Thank you. Thank you so much, Madam District Secretary. And now I would like to invite um, uh, Chief Alvarez for a presentation on the Progressive Policing Bureau. Uh, thank you, Chair Dufty, Shane Edwards, AGM of Operations. Uh, as you mentioned, uh, the, uh, this is the Progressive Policing Update. I'd like to introduce uh, Chief Alvarez, Lieutenant Mavrakis, <clears throat> Olivia Jackson, and Armando Sandoval presenting. Good evening, Board of Directors. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to update you on the progress being made in the Progressive Policing and Community Engagement Bureau. When I was first appointed BART Police Chief in 2020, I outlined my vision for safety based on my more than 20 years of experience at BPD. Its focus is improving the rider experience by boosting our visible presence in the system. Its foundation is my personal commitment to transparency and public accountability. I realize not every problem on BART requires a response by an armed police officer. We must be open to new approaches to safety and ensuring every rider feels welcomed. Embracing that concept and the value of reform shows our dedication to make BPD the most progressive police department in this country. I'm thankful for the board's support of my vision. Tonight, I'm excited to update you on the positive steps being taken by our new Progressive Policing and Community Engagement Bureau. We're the first transit agency in the country to launch such a bureau. We embrace that opportunity to set an example of how sworn and non-sworn personnel can work together to enhance safety at BART. We're going to share the latest news on our progressive policing efforts. This will include updates on our drive towards full staffing, deployment strategies, and some of the impressive accomplishments made by this team. Our non-sworn staff are out in the system and they're being highly visible. In just the last few months, transit ambassadors have patrolled thousands of trains and performed even more platform checks. Their efforts are allowing us to better engage our riders and frontline employees. That is critical to improving safety at BART. I'll also talk about our crisis intervention specialists and some of their success stories in connecting at-risk people in our system with the help that they need. We will also update you on our fo focused fare inspections at the Embarcadero station. This will include newly compiled data that shows a strong correlation between the focused enforcement and what I would describe as a dramatic reduction in calls for service. We will also share survey results that indicate the fare inspections are helping both riders and employees to feel safer at BART. Finally, we'll talk about how we're making the most of our fare inspections to connect people in need with services by deploying our non-sworn special engagement teams. They are regularly on the concourse level at the Embarcadero and ready to assist anyone who needs the help. So since the creation of the Bureau in 2020, we have made immense progress. I am proud of the work we've accomplished together and I'm excited to share our updates with you. Here's a short video of one of our crisis intervention specialists and a special engagement team. It shows and explains how we are strengthening the bond between law enforcement and members of the community. Cheryl, play the video, please. My name is Stephanie Barnes, and I'm a crisis intervention specialist, and I've been at BART for 27 years. 
the PPCE or Progressive Policing Community Engagement Department or Division of the BART Police Department is a unit within the police department where all the positions are non-sworn. And basically we've been incorporated into the department so that we can contact people that may not be of a criminal nature. And so this department was created so that there would be a network or a subdivision that could make contact with people in a different way. And basically just engage with people and talk to people about what's going on with them and if possible connect them with some sort of service or say something that may result in the situation uh, ending in a non-violent, non-threatening manner. In all my years here I've never had so many blessings, you know what I mean, and good words because basically we're saying, hey, we're not here to judge why you're here. You don't have to tell us why you're here. But I'm basically just here to check in with you and say, hey, somebody cares. We're out here looking around. You're in a place that, you know, could be risky. You may need something. Is there any way we can redirect you and help you get on your way? We see people like at their lowest point. Um, you know, some people are addicted, you know, to drugs or um, they've been estranged for their, from their family or they're having like a mental break or collapse for whatever the reason and the human spirit that keeps these people walking and standing and moving and trying is it's incredible So as you saw, we engage and connect people who may not be inclined to interact with law enforcement. This is okay. this bureau is our frontline response to those struggling with homelessness, mental health, and substance abuse. The creation of this progressive policing bureau demonstrates BART PD's commitment to safety and equitable policing. This innovative approach to crime prevention fits with the department's goal of becoming the most progressive police agency in this country. As you see in the presentation, the co-responder model has a positive and measurable effect on individuals in crisis by minimizing exposure to the justice system through collaborative alternatives. This includes training to better de-escalate intense or emotional crisis situations without using force. The success of the model depends on strong partnerships between the police, local service providers, and advocates to provide community-based responses to people in crisis. The Progressive Policing Bureau will also help the department boost its visible presence in the system while relying on unarmed personnel. Next, there. As we take a closer look into the Bureau, the BART Police Department recognizes that not every problem on BART requires a response by an armed police officer. This is one of the reasons why we began expanding the Bureau to include more civilian personnel. Safety of BART involves a team approach. The many faces of the Bureau include BPD sworn officers, non-sworn supervisors, crisis intervention specialists, and ambassadors. As you see on the slide, each classification has similar but also different roles. Each of their efforts are allowing us to connect people in crisis with services throughout the district. Let's now discuss our current staffing levels. As we take a closer look at our current staffing levels, we are hitting our goal but have had some challenges. As you know, Deputy Chief Averett is no longer with the BART Police Department. However, we are currently recruiting for two Deputy Chief positions. These challenges are not unique to our department, but are a challenge for departments throughout the country. I've made recruitment a priority, 
but with a rapid increase in retirements, fewer applicants, and turnover, we acknowledge the challenges. But we are doing our best to address them. With 84% of our positions filled, we are very proud of where we are, and we plan to be fully staffed by this fall. Our special engagement teams consist of two CISs and one police officer. We currently have multiple people in backgrounds to fill the vacant positions, and our ultimate goal is to also move sworn personnel within the department into the special assignment. Once fully staffed, the Progressive Policing Bureau will include two crisis intervention supervisors, 20 crisis intervention specialists, 10 transit ambassadors, two crisis response sergeants, and 10 sworn officers. So this is our current deployment plan. As you will see, it is two CISs to one officer. Since we are not yet fully staffed, we deploy our teams during day shift, which is 4 a.m. to 12 noon. However, we now have an additional three teams that are deployed during the evening hours, which is 4 p.m. to midnight. So as we previously committed, we are aiming to be fully staffed on each line, Monday through Friday, open to close. As we have shared our previous commitment, we are still evaluating what the best plan of action is for the district. Once we are fully staffed, the deployment will be five days a week, teams of three on every line, covering early morning and late evenings. So we established partnerships with the organizations you see here listed on the slide by county. We have been actively working with Armando Sandoval, Supervisor of Crisis Intervention and Outreach Programs, as well as Daniel Cooperman, Senior Manager of Social Services, to establish these partnerships. We're also working collaboratively to find new partnerships for the M-Line. We have shown you our, how our Progressive Policing Bureau is deployed by line and how we structure our special engagement teams. With the teams deployed by line, we can increase the presence of non-sworn personnel within the system. That ensures the effectiveness of the new approaches to safety by engaging with those in a crisis. Now we'll get into some of the statistics. We will update you on the positive steps being taken by our new Progressive Policing and Community Engagement Bureau. Right there. So this is a snapshot of the BART Police Department's quality of life calls from the last six months. The increase in calls is directly linked with the incre increase in ridership. Over the last six months, we have had around 12,000 calls that can be identified as a quality of life crisis. So due to COVID and staffing levels, the numbers have fluctuated from month to month. As you have seen, the total calls in slide 12, on slide 13, the dark blue represents the percentage of calls that have been diverted. I'm excited to share that more than 2,000 calls have been diverted from our patrol officers. With these calls diverted from patrol, this allows our officers to focus on visibility on trains and stations and on platforms. As we reach full staffing, we are expecting the number of diverted calls to go up. Currently, the special engagement teams are split into two shifts. These two shifts allow us to cover the peak hours of calls, which are early mornings, late evenings, and assist with the train inspections at the Embarcadero. As you can see, our highest number of calls are the orange line, which is from 6 a.m. to 10 a.m., followed by the red line from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. Our teams can assist with welfare checks during peak commute hours, bringing officers to assist with calls for service and respond in a timely manner. Now we'll touch on to the transit ambassador updates. 
So the Transit Ambassador Program was launched in February of 2020 and has already resulted in thousands of educational contacts with our riders. Our ambassadors are equipped with masks, Narcan, and a police radio. They can answer questions and respond to complaints and requests while riding the trains. Other transit agencies and safety professionals are taking notice of BART's efforts to boost safety throughout through the use of non-sworn personnel. As you recall, the ambassador program won the Innovation in Public Safety Award from Transit Center, a national foundation in 2020. I'm excited to update you on the positive steps that we are making with our transit ambassadors. This is a snapshot of the last six months of how their visible, visible presence on thousands of our trains. Our team of ambassadors walked more than 20 trains during a typical shift. Based on their presence in the system, there has been a large volume of calls that have been diverted from our sworn personnel. With their efforts, they are allowing us to better engage with riders and our frontline employees. Due to our success, our partners at LA Metro have adopted a similar program after they reached out to us for advice. Since November of 2021, we have increased the number and type of civilian staff to respond to societal issues. As a result of the long in-depth community engagement process with Be The Change, we listened and the district decided to create the new Progressive Policing Bureau. We committed to put forth an action plan that would hold ourselves accountable. Our action plan consisted of short, medium, and long-term goals. In the medium term, we have established a response protocol, but we know we must be flexible as we discover ways to improve our efficiency and response. In the long term, we are evaluating this program for 18 months by collecting data and analyzing the effectiveness of our response plan. It was my vision to embrace reform and show our dedication to make BPD the most progressive police department in this country. Our first goal was to increase the number and type of civilian staff to respond to societal issues. I am happy to share that we have successfully increased the number and type of civilian staff to respond to these societal issues. The second goal was to establish more collaboration with human services and counties. We have been working closely with Daniel Cooperman, our Senior Manager of Social Services and Partnerships. Mr. Cooperman partners with my department to ensure all programs are in alignment with the progressive policing policies. He is also creating a district-wide homelessness action plan advocating for specific funding opportunities to enhance services, establishing agreements, and identify future funding. Third was to engage and educate the public on BART rules, current BART efforts, and issue reporting options. We have launched a communication campaign which focuses on the Progressive Policing and Community Engagement Bureau, external resources, supporting the OIPA's efforts to increase visibility and provide riders with options to engage, and the BART Watch app because safety and security are our top priority. Fourth was to provide additional training to improve our hiring practices. We have also implemented new training to enhance and expand the skill set of the personnel within this bureau. We have also conducted a review of our hiring practices to evaluate outcomes to enhance the bureau as needed. Our goal was to also engage frontline workers in the in first response. We have now provided additional avenues for frontline staff to report disturbances and assist BPD. Building partnerships between frontline staff and other police liaisons allows us to enhance relationships for our riders. I will now share our future goals that are critical to improving safety at BART. We plan on hiring the second supervisor of crisis intervention and outreach programs by September of 2022. Our goal is to be fully staffed by this fall. That will then allow us to have a full deployment on every line from 4 a.m. to 12 noon, 
for five teams and 4 p.m. to 12 a.m. for the other five teams. For 2023, we plan to continuously train all Bureau employees so they can meet or exceed industry standards. We would like to build more partnerships with community-based organizations to assist with referrals and resources. And lastly, we'd like to create a snapshot of quarterly reports that would be published on BART.gov. I want to talk about our crisis intervention specialists and some of their success stories in connecting at-risk people in our system with the help that they need. With me today, I have Armando Sandoval, Supervisor of Crisis Intervention and Outreach Programs. He has been doing this work with BPD for the last nine years. So success stories by line. We have on the A line, we were able to connect somebody on, at the same, on the same day to a program and then were able to, you know, uh, through our partnerships in the community, they were able to house this individual for uh, long term. And uh, in the same line, an individual from out of state was taken to one of the recovery programs by Cherry Hill for detox and uh, also eventually housed and uh, temporarily. On the R line, an unhoused person was, this is one of our more successful stories, was reunified with their family after no, uh, many years of no contact. On the C line, two uh, individuals that have self, and had self-identified with developmental disabilities were assisted and also reunited you know, to program for supportive housing. On the M line, an individual from the Southern California, Los Angeles area, he uh, was in crisis on the system and was connected to a San Francisco linkage center at the Civic Center station. And now is successfully, you know, uh, after being assisted, has returned back to Southern California. With the W line, an individual suffering from a mental health condition was assisted to a sobering center and then into emergency housing. Thank you. Uh, so now we're going to discuss fair inspections. An example of the critical support that the Progressive Policing Bureau provides is their work with the morning ticket inspections at the Embarcadero Station. The following slides summarize the ticket inspection program along with the support that is provided by the Progressive Policing Bureau. Lieutenant Nick Mavrakis, who is the zone commander for the San Francisco area, as well as the affair inspectors, will provide the update on the program. Thank you, Chief, and hello, everyone. As we took a closer look at our calls for service data, <clears throat> we saw that a trend was emerging. This trend indicates a significant correlation between the focused fare inspections at Embarcadero and an increase in the number of calls for service. Monthly AM calls for service range from 3,500 to 4,500, when the average number of people removed per train is two to four. But those calls drop to fewer than 2,000, when the average number of people removed per train is five or more. That decline in calls for service has a real impact on the BART experience for our riders across the system. It's also a boost for our department. With fewer quality of life calls to handle, BPD resources are freed up to respond to emergencies. We worked with BART's marketing team to gauge how well known our ticket inspections are with riders and employees. We asked if they were aware of these efforts and what they think of them. We found that most riders were not aware of the inspections, but most employees had heard of our efforts. We proceeded to ask both groups for their opinions on ticket inspections. The overwhelming majority of both riders and employees felt the inspections at Embarcadero was either a positive or had no impact on their BART experience. For riders, nearly half of respondents told us they think the inspections will improve their experience, while fewer than one in four thought it would make things worse. Riders answered all the survey questions based on a description of the program, regardless of whether they were already aware of it. The reaction was even stronger among employees. More than 70% of employees surveyed thought their experience at BART would be much more or somewhat better because of the inspections. Only about 10% thought it would make things worse. 
During our focused inspections at Embarcadero, fair inspectors go from one person to the next in a train car. They must ask every person they encounter during their inspection activity whether they have proof of payment. They are not given any discretion. All interactions are recorded with body-worn cameras. And these focused inspections are the result of planning and coordination across multiple departments. We do this so that we can be as efficient as possible and minimize delays for riders. Our coordination with the Operations Control Center allows us to maximize the number of trains inspected. The fare inspectors are also able to inspect more trains since they are at a single location and can inspect trains traveling to all destinations in the East Bay before the trains enter the Oakland Y and are routed in many different directions. BART has conducted extensive reviews of the issues that cause missed connections and determined that the Embarcadero inspections are not responsible for the missed connections. BPD and OCC work closely to ensure that the late running trains are skipped and not further delayed. Delays and missed connections resulting from disruptive behavior are reduced. Proof of payment inspections will continue until the number of violators contacted at Embarcadero decreases or the number of passengers increases to a point where we don't have sufficient staffing to check all passengers without delay. BPD and OCC will continue to review the process and determine if adjustments are necessary to maintain schedules. Another level of coordination happens with our special engagement team. Some of the people who are unable to show proof of payment to our fare inspectors can benefit from the support services. That's why it's important that we coordinate with special engagement teams from the Progressive Policing and Community Engagement Bureau. By conducting inspections at a single location, we are able to supplement the inspections with our special engagement teams staffed by mental health professionals who offer assistance to persons who are in need of mental health programs or other services. If we were to conduct these focused ticket inspections on moving trains, we would not be able to connect as many people with services as we are able to do when the inspections are done at a single location, where the special engagement teams can offer assistance to anyone who is removed from a train and willing to accept, accept services. Our special engagement teams have also advised us that we are more likely to be able to connect people with services when we conduct those outreach in the area where that person is residing, which is usually San Francisco for those unticketed passengers who are being contacted during the morning inspections on trains leaving San Francisco. Two special engagement teams are assigned to support Embarcadero inspections. They begin their work before the inspections by checking if there's anyone in need of assistance on the concourse level. Those teams, which include crisis intervention specialists, are then standing by at both stage and agents booths to be available for anyone who is removed from the paid area. Chief? So to wrap it up, uh, we mentioned earlier how we are partnering with nonprofits in the communities we serve to leverage resources and make help available to as many people as possible. This effort is continuing in connection with the Embarcadero Fair Inspections. Our Senior Manager of Social Services, Daniel Cooperman, is currently developing a new pilot program in San Francisco with a nonprofit that specializes in homelessness and mental health services. Staff anticipates by October of 2022, our nonprofit partner will be ready to provide services and receive warm handoffs at the Embarcadero Station five days a week during the duration of the fair inspections. In addition, the agency will provide general outreach in conjunction with our progressive policing staff at the four downtown San Francisco stations after the fair inspections have concluded. I'm optimistic in the months ahead, these services paired with the continued presence of our crisis intervention specialists will provide a visible benefit for riders as well as allow for more opportunities to connect people with necessary services. Before I uh, to turn the microphone over to questions, I want to thank uh, my, my new Chief of Staff, Olivia Jackson, for putting together this uh, robust uh, 
presentation uh, for the board of directors. So with that, uh, we'll take questions. Director Dufty, you're muted. Sorry, I turned my video on. Okay. Hey, thank you so much, Madam President. And let me say, Chief, thank you for a fantastic presentation from you and your colleagues. Um, I can't not say that uh, I, I watched this presentation and thought how Armando Sandoval basically tried to do everything that is being described uh, in, in some way, shape, or form. And I really feel like the work that you chief as a, as a true leader in this country on progressive policing ha have kept faith with with what armando brought as the first employee that that our agency had uh, with a social service function so uh, i see director allen's hand is up but i'm going to start with um uh, any public comment and uh, that that may be there and i do want to um, underscore that this is an information not an action item so madam district secretary do you have any speakers Yes, we do have two speakers. Okay, Alita, please go ahead. Um, thank you again, uh, Chair Bevan Duffy. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her, uh, as I speak on this matter, I believe I have standing. Uh, I'm, I'm very appreciative of, of the work of uh, Chief Alvarez, uh, continue to be. And uh, I am in alignment uh, with um, the, the fair inspection work that we're doing because I pay fair, uh, reduced fair, yes, but I pay fair. And um, uh, I appreciate uh, that th that presentation was clear and succinct. Uh, I, I maintain to you, though, as I try to digest what the crisis intervention and ambassador programs are about, is emphasizing the understanding of diverse people. Uh, I, I, I don't know what the training is like, but I would hope that uh, these employees would be cognizant of people uh, like myself. Uh, I think it's very important in our reduced fair inspections that we not judge people by appearance because here's what I am concerned about, that, somebody, that I will present my reduced fair clipper card and so I will say, funny, you don't look disabled, and then accuse me of trying to avoid fair. But I assure you that my reduced fair clipper card has been legitimately issued to me. Uh, and I, I'm concerned even that because I am different that somebody, when I see about making contact with people, uh, I would hope that nobody would come to me and say, well, are you okay? And they would say, well, you're, they would ask me, say, well, you're wearing a skirt. Are you okay? Well, I am okay. So I ask that we not judge people by appearance, but by conduct. This should be a system that isn't just for a few established definitions, but truly the people's system, and I should be included. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Pree. I'm, I'm very confident that uh, the chief has led a, a, a culturally competent training program, and, and um, after uh, our speakers, uh, we'll give him the opportunity to speak to, to that. Um, other public speakers? Yes, we have one additional hand raised. Valerie, please go ahead. Good evening, board members and staff. I'd like to voice concern about the impact and motivation of the current Embarcadero Fair inspections. The stop and check program is extremely disruptive to commuters in practice, as even when time transfers within BART, uh, work exactly as intended. Commuters are still late to their destination and their non-BART transfers. The graph on slide 24 implies that unacceptable behavior on BART in the mornings is strongly correlated with the average number of people removed from the train. This does not communicate the impact of doing fair checks or not doing fair checks on rider safety. It reads, frankly, as regressive quota policing, and I would really appreciate more data on that front. It implies that removing more people from BART reduces passenger calls. If that's how we're going to do things, then I'd appreciate it if BART just says it straight up. There is a extreme perception, and it is treated as an open secret, that the fair inspection program as implemented is geared towards just keeping homeless people out of the system and trying to make homeless people not visible to East Bay commuters. There is a real problem with unacceptable behavior on BART. I've been in pretty uncomfortable situations myself several times. 
I don't think this program as implemented is effective. Instead, I urge BART to consider increasing presence of ambassadors and other non-police staff throughout the day, but in particular in the evening, and distributing them evenly, such as making sure that they're going back and forth on trains instead of where they always are when I see them, which is at the very front of the first car, not engaging with passengers. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Madam District Secretary, are there any other speakers? I don't see any additional hands raised. Okay, thank you. We'll move now to directors. Director Allen. Thank you. Um, and thank you to Chief Alvarez and your staff and, and everyone else who uh, presented today. Um, I've got just a few questions, and I did go through a lot of my questions um, with the staff and, and chief um, before this meeting, so I'm not asking you all those questions again. Um, on page nine, um, where we're showing the county resources by line, I remember that, um, you know, gosh, a while back when we hired Daniel C Cooperman uh, to to be sort of a, a real focused presence on this issue of connecting services, that um, we were promised a homeless action plan. And it's been quite some time, and I'm just wondering, um, because I thought part of the homeless action plan was, was really a part of these services that we were supposed to be developing. And I've got to admit that on slide nine, at least on you know zone 2c there are still only three items there of which um two of those items have have been around for quite some time and the only new one is the mobile crisis response team that contra costa county has put in place and it really is still under development it's it's not even fully baked and it's in the process of being transferred over to the uh a3 uh crisis center so um, so really, we still have the same two um, uh, county resources in Zone 2C that we had before. And then, um, you know, I think I, I, I don't actually represent Zone 2R, but it's, it's kind of the same two with one additional added grip. Um, and, and so I, I guess I'm just surprised. I really thought that we were going to develop a lot of county resource connections. And I know there are more than what is just on this chart out there. And I'm just wondering, um, you know, why, why do we only have three listed here in each zone? And then also, where is our action plan? Okay. Uh, I can take this as Daniel Cooperman. Hello, Director Allen. Uh, Hi, thank you. The, the, so the strategic action plan is right around the corner. Uh, I waited for the two, the 2022 point in time numbers to update a lot of the data. So I didn't publish a plan with 2019 numbers. So those okay. numbers came out last month. And so the plan will be around the corner for all the directors to review. Um, okay, good. And then, and then just your comment about resources. I would say for that slide, it's a snapshot of the more commonly resources the crisis intervention specialists are using, not the full library of resources available. Okay. So it's not, um, thank you. I appreciate you answering the question. It's not a great snapshot, I guess, is my feedback here. Um, and hopefully there are more that we can, um, you know, talk about, you know, showing the public that we have actually developed a lot more than this. Uh, then going on to page 12, um, the total BPD quality of life calls for service. I just wanted to point out, it was a question I asked and I didn't hear you talk about it, but on page 12, the um, numbers here are not actually calls from the public. It's sort of a combination of calls from the public and calls from uh, BART personnel, station agents, and then also these are calls that are self-generated calls by the team as they wander through the system. So um, the, the the call this, this is not all calls from the public. That's all. Um, and then as we go on to um, the next slide, slide 13, I, I was listening with interest, Chief, as you said that this, you know, the dark blue line at the top of these bar charts, uh, for example, in June, 6% of the um, calls 
for service were diverted to progressive policing, freeing up police officers. But in, in thinking that through, our um, crisis intervention teams all have one police officer. There are actually 10 police officers that were taken out of patrol and moved to this team, leaving us with, um, you know, the vacant, we've got vacancies and even more vacancies because we've moved 10 officers to this team on patrol. And in addition to that, for funding purposes, we eliminated six more patrol officers to pay for these crisis intervention teams. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little puzzled by we're diverting, you know, we're freeing up patrol officers by diverting calls to these teams that have our former patrol officers. And now we have vacancies. Um, okay, I'll move on. Um, so page 22. Um, where you've given us this, actually, before you get to there, page 19. Um, we had some conversation, Chief and I did um, quite a bit about this slide because, you know, we've been working on this progressive policing for over two years now. Um, and, you know, all along in every conversation, I have asked the question of, but where are the metrics? And I guess more importantly on this, this presentation, I would say uh, the next slide, you use the word, word success in the title. How do we define success? And I've asked this question before, and I've been, I was formerly told by um, Deputy Chief Everett that we're working on the metrics and we're working on how we define success and that we're collecting data, but we don't know, um, you know, really what success looks like. I really thought two years in that we would actually have some metrics for success. And so I want to ask, can you give me an idea, a timeline for when we actually will develop metrics? Because that's listed here in the medium term box, how success is measured. Um, but how success is measured still doesn't really tell me how did we define success of the team. And I think we do have to bring this back to $10 million per year is what we're spending for this bureau. At least that was the number back in 2020. It's probably far more than that now. So how do we find, how do we define success and when will we define success and how, uh, you know, I know how you measure it, but what is it? So, Director Allen, we, we will be, uh, I will be sitting down directly with the supervisors of the teams, and we will be setting specific goals, uh, hopefully within the month or two at max, to, to have them defined so they know exactly what it is that they have to attain to, sh to measure success and to show the work that they've been doing. So, we're gonna, can we get an update on this after you define success and talk about the process? Because I did ask you some questions about how data is collected. And I have to tell you, I wasn't real thrilled by the answer of people writing little, you know, with a pencil and a notepad, writing on, uh, you know, numbers down as they go along and then going to a desk and putting it in an Excel spreadsheet and somebody else counting up what's in an Excel spreadsheet. It's not a very scientific data collection. Um, I'm hopeful that we can get to a place where uh, if we're going to continue to do this work that the people in the field are carrying a handheld device that's going to allow them to actually collect data. So the answer to your question, Director, is yes. We, we could report back uh, what those goals are going to be. Okay, $10 million, over $10 million a year we're spending here. And, um, you know, some of our patrol officers are now here doing this work and not patrol work. Um, so I think uh, the last question, page 22, um, you have seven great stories here. And I think I asked you, um, again, this is kind of a data question. Um, are these all of the stories in the last two years of this work? Or if not, and you said it's not, uh, then how many actual connections to service do we have? This is a two-part question. And the second part is, are we, is anyone following up with the people we connect to services to determine and track and, you know, and um, 
uh, I guess, monitor whether those people actually stayed in service. And, and for me, that would be a metric of success is long term uh, out of the system, not living in transit anymore. That would be a great measure for success. Yes, Director Allen, is there Armando Sandoval again? Um, so yes, the, um, the the numbers that we came up with or the s success stories have were captured between January and June of this year. So okay. those were not the only ones that, you know, that obviously were successful. And then we're also in the process of defining what that success is uh, as well, you know, with different levels, a level one and a level two. And so these that were presented on that slide are level twos. These are individuals that do get connected to services. And in regards of follow-up, it's a, it's a very unique process to follow up with somebody. One of the things that this team is able to do is just, you know, hand that individual over to a program and then they, you know, are able to do, uh, you know, the work with them directly. So hopefully that answers your question regarding the follow-up. So, so it doesn't sound like you follow up after you hand them over? Well, that's that's a, a part of connecting somebody, you know, to a service is that then that individual becomes their responsibility. If we see them, then we're doing ongoing case management with that individual. And then we're in communication with those partners that we are working with in each county. Well, again, so we, I, I understand what you're saying, but if we truly want to measure success, then we should be monitoring whether the people we connect with services temporarily, usually those services are temporary services, we should be monitoring whether those people actually, uh, you know, move into permanent services. And if they don't, and they end up back in the, in the transit system, then have we really achieved success? So uh, the, the chief has already mentioned that this is going to be something that we're going to work on, and we okay. will report on this in the near future. Thank you. Um, Director, I, I do want to point out that um, one, of the, one of the elements here is that people have HIPAA protections, so people have the right to privacy, and so in order for case managers or other people to follow up, they have to get a sign-off, so it, it is not, what you're talking about is not standard practice, because you have to have the relationships and the partnerships, and then people go on to that agency as Armando is indicating in some cases there is continued collaboration but that's not always the case and I, I guess I would just like to highlight that um, this past week um, I just felt the urge to call uh, the mom and I, I'm not the, the now retired BART police officer um, Eric did an amazing job and uh, Melissa who is in um, Alicia Trost's shop did a video about a mom who lost her son to the streets of the Tenderloin. And, um, I, you know, I'm happy to report to you that the, the mom is running um, a, a car agency. Her son is clean and he's working in a program um, in Hawaii that is helping other people to be clean. So I really think that with the intent and the effort that's taking place here, I do think that there are more success stories and i'm sure that they're you know the team is going to respond but i just want to say that that um you know i just wanted to share that you know that just this Thank week you. i just said like hey let me just call this mom up and she was so happy and the money we raised was so instrumental in um in them getting housed so i appreciate your questions and and let me go in, uh, to director lee thank you chair dufty um Got some link there comments here, but they're prepared and we'll get through them. Um, so first, um, I really want to thank BART leadership, especially the leadership of Chief Alvarez and BPD for embracing our progressive policing work. I've only been the board for three and a half years, and I can already see a huge shift in the orientation to finding new modern solutions to safety presence and the issues of homelessness, drug use, and mental health crises that occur in our system, especially since um, the RCI that we had um, that was worked on throughout 2020. Um, I, we can see that in the overwhelming number of diverted calls, even if they're from other staff that would have been, you know, 
staff calling upon BART police to respond to something. Uh, we, we see that, you know, the overwhelming number of diverted calls show the early successes of all of our new ambassador and crisis intervention team programs. I'm really grateful this now allows us to actually deploy our officers where and when they are most needed. I have supported this progressive policing work, and I absolutely look forward to continuing that support. So thank you. Um, I just quickly want to know around um, Alita's point that she made in public comment. I just want to know the Not One More Girl initiative. I've actually confirmed with Halima Barucho with Alliance for Girls that Not One More Girl participants have been actively participating in the ambassador hiring process, um, which is awesome. Um, we talked about that. It's happening. So thank you, staff. Um, I want to note that the Not One More Girl initiative seeks to end gender-based harassment and particularly that work centered on the experiences of trans and non-binary youth. So on the presentation here today, I just want to highlight a few comments that I truthfully have already shared with Chief Alvarez and BART staff, but want to make public here. First, I am in total agreement with Director Allen and want to keep pushing BPD to develop a data-driven action plan and regularly present that process progress back to BART to, to the BART board. What are the data points and metrics you're using? How are we better understanding changes in perception of safety in our stations? What are those key performance indicators for our new programs? I know the staff, um, you all regularly present the quarterly performance reports, QPRs every three months. The key safety metric that is reported in the QPR is solely tied to part one crimes. I of course believe that is an important, but sort of a baseline safety metric is also just an incomplete picture as to what makes BART actually safe for riders. There's the actual safety versus perceived safety. And it, it, it does not help us really understand the impact of our progressive policing work. I'd like to see progress and, an up, up, uh, and another update on this by end of year. And I would be absolutely willing to put forward an RCI if things continue to stall. Um, we're supposed to be in that long-term phase of developing those metrics. So, so we have this 18 month period, so we need to see that. Um, all right, and the, the rest of my comments are really about the Embarcadero Fair Checks. I've been clear with staff that I, I'm not a huge fan of this program, particularly as our ridership continues to return. I also want to acknowledge the significant and consistent complaints that I receive, particularly on Twitter and via emails um, of riders who are inconvenienced, have missed transfers to other transit systems, um, or just simply disagree and don't feel comfortable with operations. Since operations began, I've actually shadowed them twice alongside staff, so I'm well aware of what's happening here in Barcadero is one of my stations. So given my experience and my conversations with staff, I want to sort of note three things here. Um, again, first, we need to know what program success means and track the data to understand whether the program is meeting its intended goals. That would also allow us to have a conversation about what those goals even are. Second, um, I, I know the chief, um, thank you for sharing some additional information about sort of the warm handoffs, um, but we do have ambassadors, crisis intervention specialists, and we pay for the SF homeless outreach team to cover our stations. We need to see more information about how these teams join efforts with Embarcadero operations to ensure that people who are asked to leave the trains are actually being met with services. Otherwise, we are ultimately just moving people around, not actually bringing solutions in, even when we have some amount of capacity to do so. Um, so again, it's all about the data. Third, we know this operation will eventually become unten untenable with ridership return. I, keep pushing for clarity from staff as to when these operations will end. What is that threshold and timing? And yeah, <laughs> I'll just say that. Lastly, I am so angry and frustrated that it has fallen on BART to address systemic issues that our cities and counties continue to underinvest in and are failing to address. Truly, it is incredible the work that people like Armando, the work that BART staff has done, given the lack of those services. We can't move people into permit services if they simply don't exist at the local level. And that's not BART's problem to solve at all. So I'll end by reading this comment from Calvin Quick, who emailed the board in advance of tonight's presentation. Calvin is an SF resident who takes BART daily to go to UC Berkeley where he's a student. So quote, 
BART is scapegoating its most vulnerable riders for our region's unwillingness to make the investments necessary to provide stable and affordable housing for all. To be clear, it is not BART's role as a transit agency to resolve the Bay Area's homelessness crisis, but its current strategy does little more than perpetuate the existing cycle of poverty and homelessness at all of its riders' expense. Really feel that comment, so thank you for listening to my thoughts, and um, at the end of the day, we'll keep fighting, and I look forward to continuing to work collaboratively with BART Management and BPD on this. Thank you, Vice President Lee. Director Ames, I'm going to ask for your patience because Director Rayburn lost his connection, and he's actually physically come to the board meeting room and is going to use a microphone to give his comments, and then we'll go to you next, okay? Thank you for your patience. Thank you very much, Director Dufty. And I look at the data, particularly on page 25, and I see 3,500 calls for service. Each one of those calls is a plea. It's a plea for help. It's a plea to help some unfortunate individual. And we, we note through these data that the inspections are effective. I really applaud that we have a plan to get toward greater staffing with teams deployed in the evening hours. That's great. My question is, what about the weekends? Our goal is to serve the riders. The riders are coming back whether the offices want them or not. They're coming back on the weekends. And yet, they're left high and dry. And so I ask that we have a deployment plan that includes the weekends or the inspections as well. Surprise! I think that will help bolster the confidence of our passengers. It'll help reduce the number of calls, each one of those. Think of it as if each one is translated into a customer comment and they came in and lined up in the room. I mean, and these are people that are begging, pleading. They need assistance. Often we find that the officers that are responding, they're deploying Narcan, saving somebody's life. So we need to have that system during all hours that BART's in operation. I know that that's not feasible right now. It's probably not even feasible by February when we want to augment our weekend service by opening up the Sunday service. But I think we can develop a plan that would deploy some of those new teams. You already have three teams working in the evenings. Let's rotate, let's rotate the teams around. That's my suggestion. Thank you. Chief, do you want to speak to this? Yeah, we'll take a look at it, uh, Director, when we get our full team put together and how we could spread them out over the seven days. Thank you. Thank you. Director Ames, thanks for your patience. Thank you. I just got a constituent comment that we should spread it out during the daytime, too, which is the, the time, I guess, noon to four. But but thank you for this presentation. Um, I just want to do a shout out to Stephanie Barnes because... That video really reminded me of how she was a station agent and she protected me and another station agent um, from an altercation potentially from somebody who apparently was a little threatening and she locked us into her station booth to protect us and then we called the police. But anyway, so now she is a crisis intervention specialist and she's amazing. She was working with a lot of different homelessness issues at South Hayward. And I'm really glad to see her as um, a, a crisis intervention specialist. So thank you, Stephanie. Thank you for 
PD for hiring her and promoting her. But then that gets to this question about, you know, we're training the frontline staff because this is where I was thinking, yeah, the station agents need to be empowered and work with the, the teams. So Chief, can you expand on training the frontline staff? I'm not sure if I understood that part. So we, we are uh, engaged in the recertification process when uh, station agents and train operators go through their classes. So we, we always uh, are part of that. We'll, we'll send an officer there or, or a supervisor that we have available and then we'll talk about um, how we, we work together to mitigate some of the issues in the system uh, and, and things to look out for. Uh, obviously to be safe and lock themselves in the booth if they're encountering somebody who's going through a crisis. So just safety tips like that and how to communicate to us directly to our dispatch center so we can get the get them the help that they're in need of. Okay, and then the issue that keeps coming up, like we've talked about this before, the metrics and how we're gonna get the county involved. Um, because connecting folks to services is very complicated. I mean, you've got the nonprofits there that we're working with, which is excellent. I hope this expands because I know First Presbyterian Church in South Hayward has beds and um, they're not on the list yet, um, but it sounds like they're making progress with the nonprofits, which is really boots on the ground. But then you think about the county's responsibility and maybe Daniel Cooperman can talk about this, but they do like a count of how many homeless are out there in each county. And I believe Alameda County rose to like 8,000 uh, it might be more, and you know, the I guess Daniel, if you could elaborate on this, but the problem I see is if we don't know who these folks are, we don't know the people that are just just became homeless, and then there's the people that might be chronically homeless, and so we really do need to get the names of these individuals without violating their rights. Um, but maybe, Daniel, you can just talk about what the county does and they do the count and how they're tracking these individuals. Sure. Uh, so, yeah, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the numbers for 2022 came out in June. Uh, so last month, Alameda County did see a significant increase. The biggest increase was in Oakland, uh, but across the, across the county, there was an increase. The only one of our five counties that we traveled to, San Francisco, said there was a 3% decrease in unsheltered homelessness, but the rest of the four counties saw a pretty significant increase. Um, so that's not a full, the point in time count's not 100% scientific, right? It's more of an educated guess. So the numbers are generally undercounted. It happens one morning, one day, every other year. Um, so not very accurate, and it's not a net, like a, by name list, so to speak, right? It's just a general count, right? So did that answer your question? Well, this is my frustration because it's gonna be hard to track the individual that gets help and who's out of homelessness if we don't know the description of this person in some regard, a name. And I know that there's, another, there's some counties that are working on this, they're creating MOUs and memorandum of understanding so that they don't have to uh, get into the the personal, uh, I guess it's called a HEPA violation, um, but basically you're trying to provide some privacy to the particular homeless person um, through, uh, you know, not trying to divulge some information about these folks. But if you don't have a name or some kind of identification, it's hard to track the individual and track success. And so means, I just want to ask if we could maybe you and I meet with Daniel and kind of go through this because I, I don't think everybody needs to go through it, but I think it would be helpful for you to, you know, to, to talk about it. I, I, I'm just concerned. I've been asked to move this, this um, item along because we still have two okay. more items. So um, well, okay, I wondered fair if enough. I'll I you. Yeah. I, I think, you know, from my experience in working with Daniel, I think we can get, uh, you know, a couple of good people in the room to really talk about this question. And, you know, you have my commitment on that. So I, I, I do, I am going to advise the other directors that they're only going to get a minute apiece. So um, is that okay, 
Director well, Ann. I just want to wrap up this thought. Okay. Sure. okay. Essentially, I just, I think we need to get the county involved. They need to start tracking these individuals. They do the counts. And this way we can have this collaborative relationship so we can get some grant funding because we're not getting any support from, to, 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 to support this homelessness initiative where we're trying to solve, get, you know, get these folks into services. We can't do it alone. And I'm hopeful, Bevan, I, I hope that we can work with the counties um, and come up with a, public public partnership and a grant opportunity can help fund this initiative. Thank you. Uh, so President and Director Foley, can we try and stick to a minute each? I apologize. I, I cannot. Um, I can. I was planning to be much briefer than the previous comments, but a minute is probably not possible. So I okay. will do my best to be brief, but we only hear updates on this like every five or six months. So <laughs> um, just wanted to thank the whole team for the presentation and the work you've been doing. I think the data you showed us today and the anecdotal stories are showing that you're making a real impact. I do agree more measurements would be better. And I understand that as this is completely new, you're figuring out what those measurements are. And it's not just completely new to us. I mean, as you've been saying, it's new to really the transit world. And now luckily other agencies are copying us. So I understand that you're kind of making this up all from scratch. You don't have a lot of support. You can't just copy what some other place is doing. Um, but I do agree that the more we can see about the impact this is having, the better. Um, but from what I've seen both, you know, here today and the reports I get, it, it clearly is having it, making a difference. Um, it's a more efficient use of resources. It makes people feel more comfortable, people who might not have been willing to interact with a armed uniformed police officer might be willing to interact with somebody else. So I, I think there's clearly a need and I really appreciate the program. Um, and as I mentioned that we rarely get updates on this, I am looking forward to more updates. I, I In my briefing, I talked to the chief and the team about getting some of these measurements into the quarterly performance report. We see those every quarter. We should be getting updates on how this is going. So I, I look forward to seeing some of that there. Um, on the fair checks at Embarcadero, I'm not going to repeat what Vice President Lee said, but I, I agree with much of what she said. And I encourage all of the directors to read the comments that came in. They came in in the slew of comments we got today, which all the beginning was about the mask requirement. So it's possible not all of you got to those, I don't know, three or four really thoughtful messages at the end of the pile. So please go and read those if you haven't. Um, that is just a small subsection of the many writers Director Lee and I have heard from. I don't know why they're mostly contacting us, but they are. Um, I think as we get more and more riders back in the morning commute, we are going to get more and more complaints. It is a small delay whenever it happens because, you know, trains don't usually stop for that long at a station. And when there's any kind of issue, it can lead to a large delay. And I have heard from many people who have missed their connecting capital corridor train, which when you miss one of those, you really are in trouble. It's not like you're waiting 15 minutes for the next one. You're waiting an hour or two, depending on the time of day. Um, so I, I think we really need to figure out what to do there. And the thing that I'm asking for today, and I'm prepared to bring it back as an RCI at a later date is when are we going to discontinue doing this during the peak commute hours? Because what we've heard is that it will happen when we see that it's no longer feasible and we're causing too much of a delay, but I don't, I don't like that measurement. It's not a clear measurement for me. So um, I will be coming back if, if we don't get a measurement soon with an RCI requesting this because it's something we continue to hear from constituents about. I, I do appreciate that there's going to be a more clear connection to services in the coming weeks and months, um, but we need to balance this with the delays we're causing to riders. And I know it, it, it seems to just be affecting the few people we hear from, but you have to imagine that there are lots of people on the trains. These people are on and we're just not hearing from them because not everybody reaches out to BART when, you know, they're delayed five or 10 minutes. But some of those people end up with a much bigger delay if they're connecting. So 
I don't want this to fall through the cracks in, in this bigger presentation, which is largely very positive. Um, and again, urge the directors to read those comments we got. And it's just a, a small portion of who we've heard from so far. Um, Mark, you can magician and maybe be a minute to a minute and a half. Uh, sure. I was going to yield two of my three minutes to Rebecca, but that's fine. I'll, I'll just try to go with the one. Um, I, I just wanted to say thanks to Chief Alvarez, Daniel Cooperman, or Armando Sandoval, Nick, uh, Olivia. Thank you, uh, Angela, for everyone who has really been trying to move this, um, this program forward. Um, I, too, would like to see regularly scheduled updates coming to us in the future, even if it's a quarterly or semi-annual check-in, just to understand how the how the program is moving. Um, but I also want to thank BART Police Union leadership. Um, this is a very difficult thing to do when you give away some of your sworn officer power, if you will, to a new group of employees, to these folks that are not sworn and, and trying to fold them into what you do. So I really appreciate the leadership that the union took and trying to make this work and finding ways to make this work. I really think that's important to the success of the program. Um, Director Lee, um, you're right. This is a bigger picture issue than us. Um, this really isn't our problem, but it is. Um, it's really the failure of the state to have a comprehensive plan where every county, city, agency has a piece of the puzzle to try to solve it. We're all trying to reinvent the wheel together and we're all spinning our wheels in the process. And honestly, it isn't just us, it's the US, it's the world. No one really has a solution. So we can only work together to try to, to, try to find how we can make this work. Um, Director Allen and Lee, I agree. We need more metrics at our QPR. Um, the quarterly performance reports. Um, how have the numbers improved? I think a slide that talks about how have things improved would be very important. Um, and then the last point would be um, end of line support at closing service. I have heard from station agents that feel the need to have those folks there at the end of the line, at the end of the night, because that's really when they experience a lot of challenges. And we need to make sure we have teams in place to help really put folks with the right services at the end of the day. Thank you. Thank you, Director Foley. Um, I, I'd like to make some comments. Uh, a lot has happened to this agency in the past five years as it relates to addressing homelessness. As much as I love Grace Kronikin and respect her and think she was a fantastic leader for this agency, our agency had our head in the sand as it related to it. The amount of complaints that we got from individuals that they felt unsafe on our system were enormous. And yet and still, when I put in an RCI and was joined by Director Saltzman, my original RCI went 18 months without even a two-page letter, which is what I got indicating that the, that the general manager at that time was not interested, nor was the police chief at that time. So when you look at the new leadership that came to this agency, General Manager Powers and Chief Alvarez really were a sea change and particularly for the chief this, this he you know other chiefs had not done this so um he could have he could have just slid on by or kind of given me some happy talk but he didn't do that i think he's he as as president saltzman indicated yes there was no owner manual he has come into this agency as the chief and we're doing things that nobody else is doing and so I think there needs to be a measure of patience and appreciation for what we're doing. And let me be absolutely clear. The reason that these checks are happening is based on looking at the data of people who were traveling east from the city stations and having psychotic breaks, um, <laughs> acts of, uh, you know, of threatening, menacing, all the things that we read in the reports that cause delays to the system. So yes, there is probably some delay. Uh, Lieutenant Mabraka said that they, they've explored what some of uh, those instances or complaints were, and they haven't found merit in it. Probably like most things in life, there's, some, there's a point in between those two perspectives as to whether people are missing um, connections because of these inspections or not. But I, I want to say, trust me, there would be a lot of people 
missing their connections without this program. And I'm proud of the fact that we sit as nine directors uh, from this agency and that we are doing something that has never been done for an agency that is not a, 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 an arm of a municipal government or a county government. We're in here and we're scrappy and doing a, a lot of very good things. I don't say this to say that we shouldn't have more metrics, but I, I think that this is something that should be celebrated, that we are addressing this issue and Director Ames and others and myself have pointed out, yes, it is very frustrating that the, that the cities and counties around the BART district are not helping us almost at all. But I think that the more that we uplift what we're doing, I think it makes it more and more difficult um, for the counties not to, uh, you know, not to get in gear and help us to a certain extent. So we are elected officials. I think that this is a role that we uniquely have. But I want to say I, I will take the heat on this one. I think a majority of this board feels that more time needs to be taken. We've got to, you know, keep working at this and demonstrate strong linkages, more partners, and, and, and documenting the results that there are for people. But I think that for the time being, until ridership picks up, I think, you know, the fact is we've been inviting since the beginning of this program, the city and county of San Francisco, to bring some staffers to, to come into the station and engage people. And we're actually doing that engagement ourselves right now to help people. So I, I just want to say I am very appreciative. And I, I, you know, this is a 50 year agency and homelessness has been a front burner issue in the Bay Area for 40 of those 50 years. And what I think we should do is take some pride in this listen to the complaints and criticisms of it, but I think that there's a lot to uplift and a lot that's positive. So with that, um, I am happy to close uh, this item, and I'm going to bid everyone a good night since it's almost midnight here on the East Coast, okay? Thank you so much. Thank you, uh, Chair Dufty. So we will now move on in the agenda to planning public affairs access and legislation items. So I will turn it over to Chair Foley. Thank you, Madam President. As we approach the beginning of our sixth hour of this board meeting, uh, let us turn to our two information items tonight. The first is regarding Assembly Bill 2923, Transit-Oriented Development Findings. Uh, and this is an information item. So staff, if you would take it over and take it from here. Uh, thank you, Director. Uh, Val Minotti, Chief Planning and Development Officer. And I'm here joined by uh, Abby Thorne Lyman, who's our Director of Real Estate, and Kamala Harris. Um, <laughs> Kamala really? Harris. No. <laughs> <laughs> Excuse me. Kamala Parks, who's our Senior Planner, who's been our lead on this effort to date. Um, this is an information item, as the director said, and just to note, we're intending to bring this item back for action at the August 25th meeting on conformance finding. And in your package today, there was a, a memo dated July 8th will be the basis of that decision. So with that, Ms. Parks. Thank you, Mr. Minotti. So we will go to, I'll try to be as succinct as possible. So just a reminder that AB 2923 is about BART-owned land in the counties of San Francisco, Contra Costa, and Alameda. It requires TOD zoning on developable land that is within a half mile of our station entrances. We've come to you many times before. The last time was at the February 2022 workshop. What we're talking about today is focused on local zoning. Specifically, the two questions, does it conform with AB 2923? And if it does not conform, what does the board need to do? You've seen this many times, so I'm not going to belabor it, but it just shows we've done a lot of engagement and produced a lot of materials. I will spend a little bit of time on this slide because it, it really speaks to the milestone and the process that we've gone through in order to get to this, this moment in time and the time that is coming up on August 25th. So July 1st was the deadline for local jurisdictions to conform with AB 2923. 
Um, we have been meeting with them since we've been meeting with, with them throughout the process, but we, get, we began this process in particular in fall of 2021, and it was made so that they, their efforts were minimized as much as possible, and it was a collaborative effort. The findings that were made were transparent, and they were communicated to the local jurisdictions in advance, meaning that they got our, our recommended findings at the end of June. So we're here today on July 28th to present what the local TOD conformance is to the, TO, to the BART board. And then as Mr. Minotti mentioned, we'll come back hopefully August 25th for a board resolution of findings for local conformance. So the question is, what is affected by AB 2923? And it is 10 elements that has to do with land use, density, residential density, building height, and floor area ratio. Those are the first four. And then the five through 10 have to do with parking, with the last one, a bike parking minimum. And some of the some of the baseline zoning standards differ depending on the TOD place type, which could be neighborhood town center, urban neighborhood city center, or regional center. So this, this chart shows that we have about, the chart itself is a summary of the 154 parcels that's at 34 of the station areas in the 18 jurisdictions. It's what you have on the bottom on the x-axis is those 10 zoning standards that subject to AB 2923. And what you have on the left is the percent of parcels that conform or do not. So taking residential density as an example, we see that about 40%, 40, almost 45%, the local zoning already conforms, so AB 2923 doesn't come in and affect them. But for the remaining 55%, which is shown in orange, the local zoning does not conform, so AB 2923 is, will apply to those non-conforming zoning standards. We made three of these maps that exemplify some of the elements of the zoning standards. And I'm going to actually focus on the building height one, since there's a little bit of difference between the, the TOD place types. So to describe what this map is saying is the blue dot is indicating at that station area, all parcels conform. The purple dot is indicating that some of the parcels conform. And the orange dot is indicating when no parcels conform. The size of the dot represents how much acreage that entails. So the small one is up to four acres. The medium sized dot is four to almost 10 acres. And the large dot is about 10 acres, is, is 10 acres or more. And so what this is saying is that depending on the TOD place type, the zoning must allow for five stories, seven stories, or 12 stories. And the story here is that it's varied throughout the, the, throughout the district. Um, for example, Pittsburgh Bay Point conforms with the building height at all of its parcels. Bay for, Bayfair, only some of the parcels conform. And South Hayward or San Francisco, none of the parcels conform. In the memo dated on July 8th, as well as what's included in this board packet, we had these two possible findings for each of the 10 zoning standards. One is the local zoning conforms. So the, the finding is to retain local zoning. And in the summary, that's represented by RLZ. The, set, the other determination is it does not conform. And the finding would be AB 2923 baseline zoning standards become the local zoning as of July 1st, 2022. And that's represented by AB 2923. We, below, you can see an example from Bayfair, from this, an excerpt from this memo. And you can see on the, the each parcel number what TOD place type applies to this station area. 
the jurisdiction, and in this case, Bayfair has one parcel in San Leandro and five parcels in Alameda County. San Leandro had rezoned their property not too long ago, and they rezoned to meet AB 2923, so all of their local zoning remains in place. For Alameda County, they have not chosen to rezone by July 1st, and so they conform with allowing residential as a land use, shared and unbundled parking, but for the rest of the measures, AB 2923 becomes the local zoning. We also supplied, to provide a little more clarity, the station area fact sheets. So continuing our example with Bayfair, you see geographically where each of those parcels are found on the map on the left. And then on the right-hand side, you see what is expected in terms of AB 2923 for their baseline standards and where they conform or where the local zoning remains. The next steps is that we come back to the board August 25th and you consider an adoption of resolution of AB 2923 conformance findings for each zoning standard of each affected parcel. Another thing to note is that AB 2923 sunsets January 1st, 2029. And for jurisdictions that don't rezone there to meet, their, the zoning goes back to their zoning, their original zoning. And with that, we can take any questions or discussions. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, let us turn to public comment. It looks like we have a few hands this evening. Avalon, please go ahead. Hi, I just wanted to call. I'm Avalon Schultz with the City of San Leandro and just wanted to say that we really appreciate all the work that BART staff put into this effort. Um, we have two BART stations and we're very lucky to have those and we've been doing TOD planning for a long time. Um, we know there's a housing crisis and are always looking for opportunities to accomplish more housing in San Leandro, especially near transit. Um, but this was such a clunky bill at the state level. And what BART staff did is they listened and they really helped to make this as effortless as possible for city staff. And so we just always had such a great working relationship with BART and just wanted to call to say, you know, thank you. Thank you for trying to help us um, understand this bill. Thank you for coming up with resources that would actually help us. Um, thank you for walking us through the process and giving us time to, to, you know, go over the zoning with you, make sure we were getting it right. Um, and I just am very excited to continue partnering with BART and looking forward to all the great uh, TODs that we can build in the future. So thank you so much. Thank you, Avalon. I appreciate the kind words for staff and look forward to working together. Madam Secretary. Greg, please go ahead. Thank you. I'm Greg Wolf, the Planning and Building Director with the City of Lafayette, and I'd like to echo the, the prior speaker's comments. Uh, it's been four years since AB 2923 uh, was put into law, and as we know, the regulatory framework and the landscape surrounding housing has evolved, and, and I'll say very quickly. Uh, AB 2923 is a law of the land, and, and BART has done an excellent job of implementing it. Um, I will say that none of the city councils that currently serve on uh, city council members that currently serve on the Lafayette City Council were were in office uh, four years ago. They're all new, and part of the landscape change has been our uh, the the Bay Area wide RENA allocation, and specifically Lafayette's uh, is five times. Uh, what it was in the fifth cycle, which, by the way, we exceeded our uh, total number of units in the fifth cycle. Um, as you know, housing element uh, updates require cities to analyze and identify opportunity sites, and clearly the BART parking lots are large and contiguous. They're surface parking lots with one owner that has a stated goal to build housing, and particularly affordable housing, and so I think one would be hard pressed to find a better candidate uh, as an opportunity site. And thus, um, our general plan advisory committee, our planning commission, both recommended inclusion of the BART sites as an opportunity site. The city council voted unanimously to include it in our draft housing element. 
We've prepared an EIR, which analyzes growth under 29-23. And uh, the City Council has directed staff to prepare TOD zoning and standards pursuant to 29-23. We had, despite our best efforts to try to do that before July 1, um, we, because of uh, delays in environmental review, it's gonna be a little bit after this fall. And so BART staff has been great to work with. Uh, they're responsive and informative and willing to meet with us uh, whenever we have questions. Moving forward, we, we would love uh, to see uh, us move forward uh, into a nearer term in the work plan. And we're well aware of the criteria and think we're well positioned uh, now. Uh, to score well with respect to market readiness, local support. And I think the, the biggest challenge remains infrastructure and, and that comes down to funding. Um, and so if there's any way that the board can allocate more funding for staff at BART to um, support the effort of TOD and uh, providing housing, we would support that and look forward to working with BART staff uh, moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Greg. I, I appreciate your feedback and also the request for resources. We, we hear you. Um, with that, Madam Secretary, is that all of our public comment? I don't see any other hands raised. Wonderful. Uh, do we have any director's comment? Yes, President Salzman. Uh, first, just want to thank staff for all of the work you've done on this. Um, as was mentioned by our speakers, AB 2923 was a somewhat clunky bill that then BART had to implement. Um, and the fact that you've done it with such collaboration and grace um, really shows because we didn't have a bunch of cities showing up here tonight saying, how dare you? How could you have done this to us? We have cities showing up saying we've done this absolutely the right way and made it easy for them. And also we want to move up in your TOD work plan. So it's a completely different environment when, than when this bill was being passed and what cities feared. And I think, you know, we did what we said we were going to do, which was work collaboratively. And I, I think that that shows very clearly by the comments. Um, so just thank you for the work. I think the the graphs you've shown in the, the full report shows that this bill has made a tremendous difference, um, not just in kind of the area I think people were most either excited or nervous about, which is the, the height of the buildings, but also in requiring less parking. Um, so this will have a tremendous impact on our ridership in the long term, on reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so just really excited to see this moving forward and get us moving on more transit-oriented development projects. Thank you. Thank you. Director Ames. Yeah, so my concern is um, we need to look at job centers at the BART stations and the Bay Area Council Economic Institute has had a couple of reports on this. One report came out a few months ago saying, you know, we would create more ridership more sales tax revenue if we had businesses within a thousand feet of a transit station. I don't know where they got the thousand feet from, but um, this is a the Economic Institute, which is really like a think tank. Um, and then there was a recent, uh, another report by the Beria Council Economic Institute talking about the missing middle, that those jobs, those lower, uh, they're not the high end jobs, but um, those missing middle jobs would be potentially relocated from San Francisco uh, and dispersed elsewhere. They didn't say where, but I would hope that those kind of jobs would be, um, they could apply to the BART station. So I sent the information to staff and I just wanted to ask to staff about this. You know, we have, we have a grant to look at jobs at BART on the, on the East Bay in particular. And, you know, South Hayward will have this overlay zone of residential, but I think Hayward, maybe not at South Hayward, maybe it's the Hayward station. They want job centers. And so does Warm Springs station in Fremont. They want to have job centers because we built like 4,000 homes at Warm Springs. So could you elaborate on how this compares to the efforts to create job centers at BART? 
Sure, Director Ames. Uh, this is Abby Thorne Lyman, Director of Real Estate and Property Development. Uh, so it, we see these as um, as, as uh, complementary um, efforts. Um, AB 2923 zoning. Well, well, AB 2923 only spoke to residential in terms of land use at all. There was no mention really of of you know of commercial of commercial development as in, in terms of requiring or or for that matter forbidding office or commercial development. So our interpretation of that is that it really only supplants the, or adds residential um, as a land use. So for a city like uh, Fremont, where the Warm Springs Innovation District does include uh, zoning for the BART uh, properties that does allow quite a bit of office development, it is a layering on of allowing residential uses, but not a supplanting of the possibility for office. So this is only zoning. Development is different. BART has made a commitment uh, to preserving land at certain stations where we believe we can be economically competitive to attract jobs, that we will be patient and we will, we will wait for office development to be feasible. And that is true, as you mentioned, for Warm Springs, South Fremont, as well as for the downtown Hayward station. So we're in conversations. And, and as you mentioned, we're, we just launched uh, this jobs attraction study for the corridor extending from Fruitvale to Warm Springs, South Fremont, so we can figure out how to actually deliver on this uh, commitment. Thank you, Abby. I just want, I know we talked about this before, but I wanted the public to hear this response. And I do appreciate BART's effort to get this grant and look for jobs at BART because like I said, the council studied this, the Bay Area Council, and they said that we would get more ridership and more revenue dependent on, you know, the location of the jobs, which would be immediately just to transit center. So thank you again and look forward to seeing that happen and not just housing, but, you know, a balance. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director Raver. Thank you, Chair Foley. And I want to share my appreciation to the public two public speakers, Avalon Schultz from San Leandro and Greg Wolf from Lafayette for not only staying around to the late hours of the meeting, but for your kind words to tell us what we already know, that we have tremendous planning and real estate staff. And they knew, we all knew this would be a, a heavy lift. And I know that many agencies and jurisdictions were shaking in their boots. They were afraid of what would happen and their fears were unfounded. We have, I think, a, a better Bay Area on the horizon. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Director Rayburn. Well, let's turn to the second item on the PPAL committee, which is our 2021 annual report on sustainability and I will turn it over to staff as soon as they're ready. Uh, thank you, Director. Um, and we're joined here by our sustainability team. Uh, we have uh, Paul Bostrom, who's acting group manager of sustainability, Monica Maher, who's a sustainability program manager, uh, Norman Wong from the Office of the District Architect, and our lead speaker here will be Michael Cox, a principal performance analyst, and I'll turn it over to Michael. Good, e Good evening, everyone. Today we'll be discussing our 2021 annual sustainability report, which highlights our sustainability accomplishments in the year 2021 and progress we've made in completing BART's sustainability action plan. So we'll start with an overview of what sustainability means at BART, and then we'll talk about some key highlights and case studies from calendar year 2021 that exemplify the work that we've done. Then we'll provide an update on our metrics and targets that we've set, and also which actions we've completed. And finally, we'll end with a discussion about the priorities and opportunities that we anticipate in the near future. Transportation is a major source of greenhouse gas emissions in California, and BART plays a huge role in encouraging people to shift from driving to transit. And BART also strives to incorporate sustainability into our operations and investments. So in 2017, we published a sustainability action plan 
to outline our goals and targets that we plan to reach by the year 2025. And each year we publish an annual report documenting our progress on the plan. So in our sustainability action plan, we have seven categories represented in the Venn diagram to the right. And these are based on APTA's sustainability indicators. And within each of the categories, we have targets that we're planning to reach by the year 2025 and actions, which are specific tasks that we plan to complete also by 2025. So here are some of our highlights from 2021. And the first one I'd like to touch on is in the middle box with the green plug symbol. So in 2021, for the second consecutive year, 100% of our contracted electric supply was greenhouse gas free. So that's power coming from hydro, solar, and wind sources. We also completed our move to BHQ and are pursuing LEED Gold certification. Also in the report, we have six case studies, and one that we're proud of is commissioning two new renewable energy projects that will provide approximately half of BART's electricity supply in the coming years. So as I mentioned, we have metrics in our sustainability action plan, and these represent the targets that we aim to reach by 2025. I'll focus on the first three on this page, which are related to our resource use, our total energy use, total greenhouse gas emissions, and total potable water use. We normalize each of those metrics in the second column by vehicle revenue mile. And we do this so that we can compare from year to year how much resources we're using versus the amount of service that we're providing. So because we have this normalization factor, as you'll see in 2020 for energy use and water use, it was a pretty, out, pretty large outlier year. But in 2021, since we started providing full service again, and also we have more new train cars in service and have started some initiatives to reduce our irrigation water use, that metric is trending down in 2021. And for greenhouse gas emissions, we are still well below our target in 2025, or our target for 2025. Um, in our emission and pollution control category, we are currently developing a new waste management plan that will help us develop calculations for how to measure our bin fill rates across the district. And in our materials and construction category, we began training our project delivery staff in 2021 on sustainability controls in the BFS. And we reached 18% of our project delivery staff last year. Um, so again, as I mentioned, in our plan, we have 120 actions. And this chart shows our progress in completing them. Um, so the chart, or the axis on the left, is the number of sub-actions. And the axis on the bottom is the progress we've made in completing them. So we have completed 31% of all of our sub-actions, and 26 of them are ongoing. 14 we have not started yet, and those are mostly related to our waste management plan and updates to our BFS, which are priorities in the coming year to get started on. And speaking of priorities, um, over the next couple of slides, I'll talk about our outlook for the next two years. So in our energy use category, we are planning to complete our retrofit of our parking garages with LED lighting. We have started installing some of those LED lights in 13 of 14 of planned garages. And we also plan to complete a station LED lighting study and develop an implementation plan for that. In terms of funding, we plan to use our credit revenues from the low carbon fuel standard to invest in our LED lighting and expanding our EV charging across the district. 
And on the bottom, we are always looking for opportunities to get the word out about the sustainability initiatives that we're doing. So we will continue collaborating with local transit agencies and doing outreach like things with Clean Air Day and Earth Week. Um, so that is all for tonight. And directors, this was an information item. So back to you, uh, Director Foley, if there are any comments or questions, happy to try to answer them. Thank you, Michael. I appreciated the presentation tonight. Um, let's see, I think we have at least one hand for public comment. So let's start there. Okay. Alita, please go ahead. Um, th thank you, uh, Chair Mark Foley. Uh, Alita Dupree, for the record, she and her. Uh, this has got to be my favorite topic for tonight. And I did get uh, some very helpful, uh, very good conversation with uh, Paul Bostrom on these matters. So I'm enlightened. Um, certainly, I think we have to have an explainer about this irrigation. Um, I think if we're landscaping and watering grass and trees, I think we've got to look at xeriscaping. California is kind of like a desert. And uh, at my home, uh, back home, uh, we've gone to xeriscaping. So we got to think very hard about that. And uh, certainly I would like to see in these reports some more conversions to terms that are more understandable by the public, such as kilowatt hours and uh, because we use a lot of electricity, uh, and certainly uh, to be able to talk more about our volumetric and our uh, demand draw on electricity. And, and um, I think certainly we want to work toward 100% renewable uh, because uh, hydro, even though it is emission free at the point of generation, uh, is subject to the weather. And uh, much of the Northwest Hydro is constrained by uh, uh, transmission uh, congestion. So we want to produce more of the electricity we can uh, closer to home as we work toward 100% renewable. I'm com campaigning about that for the uh, New York City subway, which I'm sure some of you have gotten to see. So there's a lot of good work going on, but there's more to do. So I come to you tonight to just try to bring you some positive energy thinking of um, right down the line, in Grand Central Terminal, through the Park Avenue Tunnel and into the light. But BART has this. BART is the people system. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Dupree. I appreciate you staying up with us this evening. Uh, are there any additional public comments? I don't see any additional hands raised. All right, thank you. Let's turn to director comments. Director Rayburn. Well, I want to thank Ms. Dupree for uh, positive energy. And of course, BART achieved 100% renewable uh, in 2020. And uh, it's, uh, we are weaning ourselves off of big hydro now. So uh, with those new solar and wind power. This is a tremendous report, tremendous progress has been made in the past year. It shows in that chart at the end that uh, I think 10 new uh, projects were started in the past year. That's phenomenal uh, during the pandemic. Uh, yeah, lots has been going, a lot of things have been going on uh, when everybody thought everybody was asleep, no. Work has been occurring. So I'm very excited about this and look forward to seeing uh, a continued implementation of the plan and bringing it back to the board on a regular basis so that um, we get to have a say in the capital projects that we think uh, would should be prioritized. I agree with what's in the list now, but I think it's uh, it's fair to share with all. So that's all I have to say. Thanks again. Thank you, Director Rayburn. Director Allen. Well, it's late, so good job, go team. Thank you, Director Allen. Uh, I'll chime in with one item, uh, and I talked to staff a little bit about this earlier, but. Um, 
I would like to see us start to have some conversations around the electrification of eBART. Um, I think that that's one segment of our line that is still dependent on fossil fuel. And if we can find a way to, to look uh, to the future in that segment of BART, I would be greatly appreciative. So um, I look forward to staff uh, engaging in some conversations and let me turn it over to President Saltzman. I just want to say I agree. I think, you know, I wasn't here when it was decided to make it, to not make it electric. Um, but I did sort of in a protest vote, a vote against, you know, purchasing the actual diesel units. So, um, I, yeah, I think I wish we had all been on the BART board when they made that vote because I think we would have made a different decision. But I know Director Foley has asked for this before. So I guess I'd like a response from staff on what could be the process for us to even start to look at what the costs would be both upfront and over time and all of that. So we could make this an actual thing to consider instead of just a dream of director. Foley. Thank you. And I, I won't hope, well, I, I don't think staff has an answer, but if they do, I'm ready to listen. Uh, good evening, AGM of operations, Shane Edwards. Uh, to answer a portion of that question, uh, we absolutely can take a look at the feasibility. That's not the hard part. It would be the transition from where we stand now to an electric railroad. Um, but there are very many, there's a lot of options out there um, and we are open to that. We may have to purchase at least one more backup unit just to bolster what we have now until we can get an electric railroad. But we'll take a look at that and uh, we can get back to you. Yes. Great. Thank you. And also, I echo Director Allen. Great work. <laughs> Thank you, President Salzman. Director Lee. I'll just be quick. First, I'll just note about eBART. When I like learned about eBART, I was shocked that the E did not stand for electric. So I'm just, I, it's, it's a misnomer for a lot of folks, I think, just saying. Um, I actually just really wanted to celebrate the fact that the two um, uh, renewable energy projects, I know um, Directors Foley and Rayburn, you actually went up and, and, and Ames, sorry, you actually went up and toured one of them. Um, what a huge difference that has made that we are well over 50% state-defined renewable energy, we already hit the, you know, 100% greenhouse gas emissions, you know, uh, last year, I think it was. Anyway, that's a huge achievement. Um, and in the spirit of BART of always doing more, I would love to see um, Nick Sears report, you know, telling us how, how we really get to that 100%. But that, that's just great work. Um, I'm really proud to see that. Thank you, Director Lee. Uh, seeing no other comment, I will conclude the PPAL committee and turn it over to you, President Salzman. Right, we will get to the last item on our agenda, which is item 13, board matters, and we will take A, B, and C together. So if anybody has any reports or RCIs or in memoriams, please raise your hand, Director Rayburn. Last week was a great week for the Lake Merritt Station area, as uh, General Manager Powers indicated. Uh, we received the final permit uh, approval for moving forward with the affordable housing component on uh, what today is the parking lot. Um, I'm, in, I'm just ecstatic to get to this stage because I've been going to meetings since 2010 on uh, the station area and um, it's tremendous. But it doesn't end there. That occurred on a, uh, a Wednesday uh, afternoon. The day before, another project nearby, what we call the remainder parcel from Measure DD, was also approved for Ibalsi to move forward with constructing 91 units of affordable housing on a parcel that was what I call the world's shortest freeway at one time. And now it's depaved and it's the dividend. 
Um, and so everything's happening in the right way for a change. That the bar project itself was in part a catalyst for the remainder parcel to even have a glimmer of hope. And finally, it it's going to happen. I also want to share one thing that direct, uh, General Manager Powers left out, and that's that the chair of the Planning Commission commented that BART staff are just tremendous, and they've been very professional uh, throughout. So you don't always hear that from outside sources. And so it, it really is testimony to, you know, the Cracker Jack team that we have. I also want to do a shout out to uh, Aisha Brown and Kevin Floyd, who staffed the BART booth at the Art and Soul Festival this past Saturday. It was a tremendous event. Um, and I had a lot of fun. Uh, people were out and about, and they loved coming up and talking BART with us. So it was uh, it was a great event, and I thank staff for seeing their way clear to uh, facilitate that we had a presence at the Art and Soul Festival. Thank you, Director Allen. Oh, I, I just wanted to make one suggestion. Um, I, I believe that these committee meetings that we do, like the audit committee, and uh, I, I don't know if the personnel committee met, um, but we are supposed to be reporting out at our board meetings, um, you know, what goes on at those committee meetings. And so um, I know that Director Dufty's not here now, but, um, you know, we, we should be making I think a better effort to report out what goes in those meetings, what goes on there. I'm happy to add that to as a very brief agenda item, just as a standing item reports on any <laughs> committees, as long as we all commit to keeping those reports brief, because they're all public meetings and any of us or the public could attend them. But I, I think that's a good idea. So it's, we don't have to wait till the end of the meeting to get to that. So we'll okay. work on getting that on the next agenda. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Vice President Lee? Yeah, um, I just wanted to note that um, I per was invited to and participated uh, on a panel discussion um, that was hosted by Stop API Hate on June 30th that was really focused on their legislative agenda, which includes SB 1161, which this board supported. Um, I was really excited to be joined by Halima Barucha, who I mentioned earlier with Alliance for Girls, although she is just about to leave. and head off to higher education, um, as well as Jupiter Peraza, who is with the Transgender uh, Cultural District in San Francisco. Um, it was just a really great discussion. And if anything, so many folks in that crowd who like really aren't that familiar with BARD or certainly not the Not One More Girl campaign, were blown away by the work that BARD is doing. Um, we got so many positive comments and it was immediately like, why aren't other agencies not doing this work? And to have Halima there as really this incredible and very credible uh, community leader uh, speaking those praises, I think was just uh, great. I saw um, Alicia's in the room, so props to you, Alicia, but really props to um, the entire BART staff and the leadership of Bob Powers to really embrace this initiative. That's great. Uh, Director Ames? Oh, yes. Um, we had a meeting, I just, I just lost this, oh, July 14th, um, regarding the viewer maintenance complex phase two, where's an environmental, uh, or it's a public meeting, but to talk about the environmental impacts, and nobody showed up. <laughs> so they video recorded this, comments are due August 8th, um, I believe, and, uh, but that was kind of strange, but they did do a lot of notification, and so the video is online. Uh, the other thing that I did was I attended the Bay Area Council uh, Goods Movement Subcommittee. Okay, so now the Bay Area Council is looking at freight, my favorite topic of all time. <laughs> 
So they're looking at freight impacts. They're looking at the Port of Oakland issues. Uh, the Port of Oakland has uh, dropped in their competitive edge from number five to number 10 in the, I think in the nation. And so the Bay Area Council is lobbying in DC. I think they also met with a Congress, um, there was a congressman, no, I can't remember who, maybe it was Barbara Lee. But anyway, um, they're trying to get some money for the Port of Oakland, uh, obviously, to help with their efficiencies at, at, at the port. Uh, you know, we're trucking out 99% of cargo out of Oakland. So the council sees this as an issue, and I look forward to seeing recommendations coming from them on potential improvements and potential funding opportunities to improve that. And that will also help with Link 21 and, well, any circulation in and out of Oakland related to passenger rail as well, because the passenger rail uses freight lines. All right, that's my plug. Thank you. Thank you. And Director Foley? Thank you, Madam President. I am delinquent on my thank you, so let me go through a few of these. Uh, to Christopher Gunn, thank you. The district received a AAA credit rating from Fitch regarding our general obligation bonds uh, a little bit earlier this year. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you to Mickey Morales for her assistance with all of my after rail conference coordination. She did a great job keeping my paperwork straight. Uh, thank you to Sadie Graham, the Brentwood Innovation Center um, the, the assistance you provided with their uh, city council is greatly appreciated. Um, thank you to uh, Javed Khan, uh, Khan, excuse me, uh, for staying late and handing out tickets to riders with me at the Antioch station last Friday night. I appreciate your, um, your uh, being there and partnering with me when we were at the station. Um, and last but not least, I want to remind folks your semi-annual filings are due by August 1st. So please don't forget to follow your 460s. That's it. Thank you for that reminder. <laughs> um, any other reports? If not, I, I do have something. So I, I don't have anything to report on besides the El Cerrito Plaza outreach, which I already spoke about. Um, and just on personnel committee, there's, there's really nothing to share because it was pretty much all closed session. Um, but I do have an in memoriam. I would like to adjourn today's meeting in memory of Shirley Douglas, who passed away last month on Monday, June 27th. She was 73 years old. Shirley had decades of experience working within public transportation throughout the Bay Area. As a transportation professional and as a long-term active member of both Compto and WTS, she was a staunch champion for equity and inclusion. Shirley graduated from Oberlin College in Ohio with a bachelor's degree in government, and then she attended UC Berkeley and earned a master's degree in city and regional planning. She began her professional career working for the City of Oakland's Housing and Community Development Program, and then she later became a project manager at Bechtel Corporation, where she worked with BART staff on the BART to SFO extension. After she retired from Bechtel, Shirley managed community relations at the San Francisco Bay Area Water Emergency Transportation Authority, also known as WIDA. And after retiring from WIDA, she started a consulting firm, S. Douglas Consulting. Then after she truly retired, she remained active in Compto and WTS and volunteered with the Oakland Museum of California as a docent. Shirley will be dearly missed, and we offer our deepest condolences to her family, friends, and colleagues. In her memory, I would like to adjourn this meeting in her honor. And with that, I think we can adjourn the meeting. Thank you all, and um, thank you for helping us adjourn before 10 p.m. <laughs>